Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Network on Sunday, October 23rd, 2016. This is episode 1334. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. From Quicken Loans, Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash techguy. And by Sonic. Literally, Sonic's 10 gigabit fiber internet into Twit gives us the fastest, best connections we've ever had. Join Sonic's internet revolution as they bring fast, affordable internet, phone, and TV to homes and businesses all over California. Visit sonic.com slash twit to sign up for service and get your first month free. Well, hello there, happy, shiny people. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about tech, computers and the internet and... Uh, Oh, boy. It's all tech these days, isn't it? Technology's here in so many ways. We talk about electronic voting, distributed denial of service attacks. Those attacks that brought the many parts of the Internet down on Friday. We also talk about smartphones, the uh, iPhone 7 or the Google Pixel, smart watches, um, virtual reality headgear, you know, all the stuff. With a chip in it. That's what this show's about. And we'd love it if you'd participate. I would love it. I personally would take it as a personal favor if you would call 8888-ASK-LEO and join me on the air here. Whether it's with a question. Get a lot of those. Why does Windows never work? <laughs> that kind of thing. Or a comment or a suggestion. Something that works for you that you'd like to share with the world. 888-827-5536. The website Yes, we have a website. What kind of technology show wouldn't have a website? For crying out loud. We got a website and a chat room. How about that? Website is techguylabs.com. And there you'll find a link to our IRC chat room so you can participate behind the scenes with our fine chat family. 888-827-5536. Techguylabs.com. I think that's everything you need to know. So uh, we're learning more. Thank you to Lorenzo Franceschi Bicarai, who wrote an article in Motherboard, the uh, Vice Technology page, on exactly how, you may have wondered, the bad guys broke into the Democratic National Committee, the Clinton campaign chair, John Podesta, and former Secretary of State Colin Powell's Gmail accounts. And it was darn simple and it's a it's a cautionary tale for all of us they did it with a technique called spear phishing you've heard of phishing p h i s i h i n g phishing phishing is those emails that you that are sent out that are phony emails from banks or the irs or your you know and sometimes you'll you'll, you'll know it's a phishing email cuz you'll get a bank uh, an email from a bank that's not your bank right or uh, you know it just is clearly not for you, but sometimes it looks un real. And the, they, when they can send out millions of emails basically for free, hackers are glad to, you know, they don't care if you go, well, that's obviously phony, as long as they get, you know, a few people biting. In this case, these were spear phishing attacks, which is a very apt name. Phishing emails targeting a specific person or organization. In this case, targeting Colin Powell and targeting John Podesta. And inside the uh, email was something you probably have all seen. Um, it's, it's very credible. It came from, it looked like anyway, from Google. Someone has your password on a big bright red banner. Hi, Colin Powell. <laughs> Hi, John Podesta. Someone has just used your password to try to sign into your Google account. And it'll say the date and the time, location, well, this one says Ukraine, you know, somewhere scary. Ukraine's not that scary. Somewhere scary. Bulgaria. Whoa! Transylvania. Anyway, uh, Google stopped this sign-in attempt. The, this is phony, by the way. 
although it looks real. Google stopped this sign-in attempt. You should change your password immediately. Then there's a big blue button, change password. Beware of big buttons in emails. In fact, really never click a link in an email because it's easy. This is what we call an HTML email. It looks like a web page. It's got graphics. It's got fonts. It's got a button. The problem is that button says one thing, but what lies beneath is hidden and, in fact, probably is not where you think you're going. In this case, it was a bit.ly link. So that's one thing. You know, there's a, bit.ly is a very commonly used uh, link shortener. You've seen it maybe. B-I-T dot L-Y followed by something. That's, uh, people use those all over the place so you don't have to type in a long URL. You see it on uh, Twitter and places like that. Twitter has its own t.co. Oh, we even have ours uh, for my company, the podcast network, Twit. We have twit.to. But Bitly uh, was used in these emails. And if you were able to resolve the Bitly link, you'd see it goes to, well, something looking pretty credible. My account. Well, okay, here's a couple of problems, first of all. It's not HTTPS which it would be if it were really Google. It's HTTP. Hmm, okay. Myaccount.google. Oh, that sounds good so far. Dot com dash security settings page dot TK. And this is a tricky one. This is a good one to fool you because you just stop at myaccount.google.com. You don't know that there's a dash. You're not really going to google.com. You're going to com dash security settings page dot TK. That's where you're going. The Google is just an extra thing tacked onto the front to fool you. And then there's a lot more. And the reason we know this is a spear phishing attack, this is the actual link, by the way, uh, that uh, was sent to John Podesta, the chairman of the Clinton campaign. And we know that because there's a lot of gobbledygook with letters and numbers and stuff. And that, and that all resolves out to his Gmail address. So we know that this isn't a link that's randomly sent to a lot of people. It's sent to one specific person. We also know, and this is a funny thing. Now, this is a little suspicious. The people who created these links did not make their Bitly account private. That's possible. They made it public. So we can go back, and they never deleted this data. And look, and lo and behold, there were two clicks on this link. Just two. Because it was only sent to one person. And it was in March 2016. That that shows you that was a spear phishing attack. Now, you might get an email like this. Well, what do we do when we get an email like this? Do we click the link in the email? No, we do not. And if you do say, well, I'm going to do better than that, I'm going to look at the address that the link goes to first. Maybe you're real smart. I'm going to look at the underlying code. You still might be fooled by myaccount.google.com and not notice that that isn't really where you're going. You're going to com dash security setting page dot tk this account and this is why i find this a little suspicious lorenzo does not but this account is owned by somebody called fancy bear <laughs> apt 28 a russian hacker believed to be a state-sponsored russian hacker and after this link was sent out by the way again this person sophisticated hacker though he or she may be did not make this private did not hide it in any way that makes me always makes me suspicious because one of the things hackers like to do is uh is kind of leave false breadcrumbs right to try to ascribe it to somebody else however as we know the united states intelligence community is satisfied it was in fact fancy bear a russian state sponsored hacker in any event uh you see this link click twice in March, and then lo and behold, October surprise, October 9th, a whole bunch of Podesta's email shows up on WikiLeaks. So, uh, we, you know, we know Russia's doing this, but there are others doing it. And it may not be, uh, you may not be the chair of a major campaign. <laughs> you, may, you may not be a former Secretary of State. You may just be somebody puttering along in your normal life like me. And you may even see that email from Gmail and says, oh, wow, I got to change my password. Somebody's hacking my account. No, no, that email is the attempt to hack your account. Don't click that link. And by the way, and this is another thing that I 
wish everybody would point out, had Colin Powell or, Ma or John Podesta had two-factor authentication turned on on their Gmail accounts, this attack would have been a lot harder to perpetrate. Maybe they'd log in to this phony page and then it would say, oh, what's your second, your two-factor, and you'd give it. But that gives the bad guy 30 seconds to act on it because those those uh, second factor authentication passwords change every 30 seconds. That's a big... Turn it on if you don't have it. All right, let's go to the phones. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. No, I haven't had a chance to do that. How does Amazon Echo's space localization work, Dr. Mom? They keep adding new things, cool new things to the Echo. What do I do? What do I do? Transitional... Sp no, that's not it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Scooter X. I, I've gotten fooled by uh, an SMS that purported to come to, from Apple saying, we found your iPhone. And they came right after my son lost his iPhone. So I went, oh, <laughs> they found his iPhone. And I clicked the link and noted that it wasn't Apple US. <laughs> it, was, it was like Apple the Bulgaria or something. Cream and Corn Cob, in my opinion, the Pixel is not worth the money they're charging for it. Um, but if you're going to get an Android phone, the Pixel is probably the best Android phone. And spatial perception. Wow. Whatever could that be? Have you tried it, Doc? Existing Amazon Echo and Echo Dots to receive spatial perception. That's spatial. Oh got to get a software update. Oh, that's good because uh, I have that problem. We have a, an echo in the gym, which is next to the kitchen, and an echo in the kitchen, and frequently both respond <laughs> and both set timers and all sorts of things. Yeah, Marty McFly was only off by a year. Now, did it say the, did it say the Cubs win the pennant or the World Series? Because they still haven't won the World Series. It was the World Series. Ah, so we still got to – it's not true yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's why Florida Vet, I go to DSL reports for my speed test. It's lesser known. You, you know, you got to, you know, the ISPs know, they might know about that one for all I know. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO. Scooter X in our chat room said the exact right thing, which is you should always be careful clicking a link anywhere that comes to you, links that come to you, phone calls that come to you, those often are bad guys. Make the, make it an outbound call. If you think, if Microsoft calls you, I got another one the other day. Hello, this is Windows. <laughs> That's a giveaway, right? Hello, Windows. <laughs> you're, we have seen unusual activity on your account. You're being hacked. And then I, I my new thing, I don't know if this works. I'm very proud of myself. Sometimes people will keep them on the line for hours. I don't have time. Sometimes they just hang up. That doesn't. That's not very satisfying. Sometimes they yell at them. That's not nice. But my new thing, I love doing this, is does your mother know you're doing this? Would she, would she be proud to know that you're scamming innocent people? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? And then I hang up. The <laughs> reason I hang up is because usually that elicits swearing on the other end. They will swear at you. <laughs> they get mad at you because you're not susceptible to their hacking scheme. Jeez Louise. Does your mother know you do this? Shame on. Surely you could find something more <laughs> constructive to do with your life. Uh, so, yeah, don't, don't inbound stuff to you. That always should be suspicious. Like, hmm, they're calling me? The IRS doesn't call you. They don't call you. They don't. Uh, hmm. You know, Gmail sending me a warning. Now, if you really say, well, this could be true, then the thing to do is to 
go out on your own and call Microsoft, call their support line, or go to Google's Gmail and log in and see if there's a problem there. You could even, if you feel worried, change your password, but do it because you went there, not because they pulled you there, because they're not going to pull you where you think you're going. I think. I think. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo, that's the phone number. Kim Schaffer is here, the phone ranger, answering the calls. Just heard that same story yesterday from a friend, but it was Apple, and she was having problems with her iCrowd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling from your iCrowd is not working. Wow. She's like, could you say Cupertino? <laughs> wow. iCrowd. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> wow. She said, what you're doing is illegal, and they hung up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like to shame them. I like to make them feel <laughs> terrible and rotten about themselves. Yes. Anyway, hi Kim. Good morning. You, I see, have already filled the board. You're very industrious. I who am. should I, who should I address I, first? Again, here? we're going to spend someone's money. Yeah. And uh, you know, the VR. He wants a VR machine, and since you've played with all of them, I think you could probably <laughs> give him a, a VR machine. All right, Kim. Thank you. This is Rick in uh, Hesperia, California. Hi, Rick. Hey, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm I'm looking at VR different VR um, machines. <laughs> yes. Right now I've got um, I have a PlayStation Four and I also have an iBuy Power um, gaming computer, so I can go either route. I can go with the Vive, I can go with Oculus, I can go with PlayStation Four, and just trying to figure out what the what the best route to go, or if I should wait. So VR, the idea is that you put on this visor and generally. Uh, the visor, um, you know, is like a blindfold. It takes over all your vision. There's two screens in the visor, and they're pretty close to your eyes. You're looking at those screens. And the visor has built into it the uh, accelerometers that tell it when you turn your head, when you look up, when you look down. So it will change the display as you move your head, giving you the illusion that you're actually somewhere looking around. And it, it can be a, quite a convincing illusion uh and to the point where i we were playing with the uh, oculus rift which is a facebook owned company and i was putting it on some people and there's a just a demo that comes with the rift where you're standing on the edge of a building like a like a skyscraper and you're looking down and to a person everybody who tried this out went whoa <laughs> and, ste and step back so it's it is an effective illu illusion it is an illusion and 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 there are some negatives to it some of these devices, the PlayStation uh, VR and the Vive, also have devices you hold in your hands. That's really useful because if you think about it, <clears throat> if you can't hold something, it's hard for you to pick up things and move around. The Oculus Rift gets around that with using a game pad, as does Gear, uh, the uh, Gear VR from uh, Samsung or Google's Cardboard, which are the lower end versions. Have you tried uh, any of the cheap ones like... The Google Cardboard is really cheap. You can get it for you know I, five bucks. Yeah, I have. I I tried the Google Cardboard. I actually tried the the Samsung Gear. I good. Also tried the Oculus. The Oculus is really cool. Yeah, um, it's good to try these before you buy because they they are expensive solutions. The least expensive, of course, besides cardboard and gear, which aren't really fully immersive gaming uh, platforms. The least expensive would probably be the Sony, since you already have a PlayStation Four. The negative on the Sony, and I played with all of them. Uh, we own all of them. Uh, the negative on the Sony uh, PlayStation VR is the Move controllers, which really weren't designed for VR. Um, and it's using the camera that came with the PlayStation, you know, the older camera. So, But I don't find that really a disadvantage. One thing to note is the PlayStation VR is designed to be played seated. Oculus lets you stand up, but you can't move around too much. You mostly can just lean and, and, and sway. Only the Vive of all of these gives you a playing area. Now, the disadvantage of that is you have to have a fairly large space, like a six-foot by six-foot space, to set up the two spatial recognition um, projectors that are either corner of that space. And so, but if you have the space for it, that's the most vivid experience because you're moving around. Then there's the other, the final piece of the puzzle is games, which games, you know, because, you know, if you choose between an Xbox and a PlayStation, really the choice comes down to what games are available, you know, and which has the better games, right? Well, ultimately, that's going to be the same thing for a VR solution. I think, sadly, the Oculus has the better games. I think the Vive is the better technology. Oculus will be coming out with uh, controllers this year, hand controllers. They showed the Oculus Touch controllers. 
It's a lot of money, though, when you add this all up. We're talking seven or eight hundred bucks. All right, I, I, and I, the only reason I was leaning towards PlayStation was because the, I figured that they you already have it. Infrast- no, I I have the PlayStation Four. Yeah, you're right, and, but I also have a gaming computer. That yeah, that's true. Handle. But even with the gaming computer, it's eight hundred bucks for the Vive. Right. Yeah. So I think I think precisely because you're already a PlayStation VR user. Uh, they're coming out with 30 games, 50 by the end of the year. I've played a couple of them. They're really fun. It is seated, but in some ways that makes it better because uh, you're going to be less likely to get uh, nauseated. That's one of the problems with these is for about 10% of the population, you're just going to get nauseated. There's nothing right. you can do about it. You're going to use it, and you're going to go, hmm, I'm queasy, and stop. Well, I, f- I read something about the latency on the on the PlayStation um, being different not and making it so you don't get quite as sick. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, it's lower resolution. There's, you know, there's tricks to play, but it, in my opinion, all these guys say latency because that's something they can fix. What they don't talk about is what I think is the real cause of the nausea, which is the dis, the difference between where your eyes are focusing and where your eyes are converging. And in our, you know, monkey minds, if those two don't match, we ate some bad mushrooms and we better throw up. <laughs> Seriously, and and that's something that's very hard to fix. So they don't like to talk about that. I think all of them make you nauseous, or it makes certain people nauseous. The answer to your question, I think since you already have a PS4, get the, there'll be better games, it'll be more fun, it's less expensive. That's going to be a great way to get your feet wet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. Lizard brain, not monkey mind. You're right. It's the, 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 it's the unconscious mind, the lizard brain. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Your lizard brain thinks you ate magic mushrooms. <laughs> Twisted Mister says, Nausea is the difference between where your lunch was and where your lunch is. <laughs> There's the inner ear issue as well. Right. Um, so you've got those three things. Latency is kind of related to the inner ear issue because your head's turning. In fact, it's exactly the inner ear issue. Your head's turning, and the picture, even if it's just a few milliseconds behind, is turning slower. So that's that inner ear issue where you are moving, but the, there's no the, there's a uh, inconsistency between what your inner ear is saying and what your eyes are saying. That's the same problem as the difference between convergence distance and focal distance. Your brain goes, that's not good. That's not good. Yes, yeah, lizard. It's not. It's your subconscious. I don't know if it's your subconscious. I think it's your unconscious. It's your autonomic nervous system, which I don't think is your subconscious. Your subconscious has kind of Freudian overtones. I think it's your your your, it's your lizard brain. It's your it's the stuff that keeps you breathing. If you you know if you're unconscious. <sighs> should come up with like power glove things instead. I'm sure they will. And I guess that's really the the bottom line on this is it's just very, very, very early. And I, I'll say this when we come back, but it's kind of like the Atari 2600. You know, you're in the earliest days of this, and I don't find it that compelling. I mean, I play with it, and it's cool the first time you use it. I don't find it something that draws me back day after day. Um, good. So, But I'll get a pushed update, Dr. Mom. That's good. That will help a lot. Well, I do, the, you know, Lynn, I'm running, you know, well, okay, so the two times they've called, one was I was in the car driving. I should have said, okay, I'm on a Tesla. What do I do now? <laughs> and the other one, I was just standing in my closet. <laughs> Are you in front of your computer right now? I'm in front of my shoe rack. Yeah, the VRPC is sitting in the corner collecting dust bunnies, screaming corn cob. It's literally doing that. I put up, I put the Vive. We set out a, a six by nine area. I put the two Vive um, devices. They're not cameras. They're actually uh, just projectors. I put them up in the corners. Um, I got you know our ultimate virtual reality gaming machine, which she spent five thousand dollars to build. And actually, the the first thing that happened was the anniversary update borked it so that I get blue screen. So I. I tried to fix that, and then I gave up. And But that's the point, is like, yeah, one of these days I'll get around to fixing it. Even Michael isn't really pushing to fix it. 
I think it's fine to play games on a screen. Yeah, neural link or nothing at all, says Plutonium. Sure, I agree. I've been trying to wrap my mind, my head around VR, virtual reality, because, you know, that was the fad. If you're going to, when we look back at the end of the year next month, at our end of the year, two months from now, the end of the year specials, I think one of the things we'll say is this was the year of VR, right? Virtual reality. Every big company came out with their VR solution. Others showed future VR solutions, both Apple and Microsoft talking a lot about AR, augmented reality. This, you know, this is the year of V slash AR. But I have to say, this is, we are in the very early stages of it. And it's weird because VR has been around. I remember my first experience in a VR helmet in the early 90s. That's 25 years ago. Um, putting on a helmet now was admittedly attached to a very, a million dollar uh, silicon graphics machine. And it had a big, fat cable coming off the back of it. I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was riding a pterodactyl. It was dramatic. And it was not much different, frankly, except for the cost of the hardware, from the uh, virtual reality we have today. We haven't made massive improvements, frankly. We've, just low, we've basically brought the cost down. And you can thank the smartphone for that. Because really, what's made VR possible in your home is that we have... Computers that are as powerful as those million-dollar computers for a lot less. Frankly, your smartphone's as powerful as you need to be. We have now small, high-resolution screens, thanks to smartphones, that you could put in these visors. We have the accelerometers, thanks to smartphones. You know, your smartphone knows how it's oriented in space. Same accelerometer that goes in the VR headset. So, really, what's happened with VR isn't as earth-shattering as you might think it's really just reducing the cost of it making it something you can carry around with you with in the case of the gear vr the samsung product or the google cardboard using your smartphone or use a high-powered but still you know affordable relatively affordable pc a 1300 dollars pc um, with these headsets and controllers so the actual you know change only is the price and the software, I don't think, has really changed much since the days I was flying on that pterodactyl. We've got more of it. I think we're still in the early days. It's still Atari 2600 time. And it's not clear exactly where we're going to go. We have to solve the nausea problem. Because no, I think no consumer technology can succeed if 10% of the people who use it get queasy. And we don't know if it, ahead of time if that's going to be you. Are you going to buy a product that has a 1 in 10 chance of making you throw up? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think there's a precedent for that. There's also the issue of you look kind of dorky. And we already have some pretty good immersive ways to play video games. People have invested a lot of money in fast computers, big screens. Frankly, the console gaming experience is very, very good. We have pretty good immersive video games that don't make you throw up. So... I'm, I think there's a certain faddish excitement over virtual reality that isn't yet justified by the technology. Now, next year, the year after, in two years, five years, sometime, maybe the, some, they'll make some breakthroughs. People don't get queasy anymore. The games are amazing. You feel like you're really there. But at this point, it's, uh, frankly, it's a novelty. It's still a novelty. So unless you're a serious gamer and you really want this experience or you just know I'm going to love it, or, and even then I would try before you buy just to make sure it doesn't make you queasy, spend an hour in a headset before you buy. Not 10 minutes, not 5 minutes. Spend an hour in it. Play a game for an hour. Then take off the head visor and say, you know, the sweaty visor. <laughs> you blink because you're now in the real world again. It's a little disoriented. By the way, they, they call this um, motion disorientation. This is another issue that people don't talk about it much. It's not just queasiness. It's actively disorienting. And for, for some people, for as long as 24 hours, you're slightly drunk. I kid you not. The, the real world is kind of ugh, weird. It doesn't make you queasy. But it does make you walk into doors and stuff. I wouldn't drive a car for a while. This is even the Air Force's conclusion when they've studied this. They call it simulator sickness. So 
I think we got a way to go. I think there's a lot of hype. And as with a lot of technology, sometimes the hype doesn't live up to the reality. Mike in Fullerton, California, you're next. Is that right? I can't quite read it. Sorry, Fountain, California. Hi, Mike. Actually, it's Fountain, Colorado. There you go. CO, yeah. not CA. Well, I apologize. Hi, Mike. How are you doing, Leo? Very well. Uh, update on AHCI. It does make everything run faster when you're finally loaded up, but because of the OCZ uh, garbage gathering, which starts at startup, it takes a little longer to log in. So that's very good. Okay. I like it. It works well. And I thank you for your advice on that. Good. The question I have for you today is, do you know of an active background for your desktop on Windows 7? Active in what sense? Do you want the old-fashioned active desktop where you had gadgets on there with a clock and weather? No. Uh, active in the sense of motion. Well, I'm sure somebody's making such a thing. I'm not sure I'd recommend it unless you have many CPU cycles to spare. Um, well, you know who actually, I would... I do. I would check Stardock because they, they really... They do all of the most interesting stuff, Stardock.com. They do uh, Windows kind of modification software okay um uh they've actually gone more into gaming it looks like lately but they have wow. object desktop which is a windows customization customization experience and i think that their one of their object desktop features is exactly what you an animated uh modify what well, you want like clouds to move behind your Screen. Yeah, or, you know, spirals or psychedelic or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would bet you Stardock has something like that. The nice thing about Stardock, you can buy the complete object desktop. It's not very expensive for 40 bucks or something. Or you can buy the pieces that you want, which uh, I'm pretty sure one of them, yeah, it's forty nine ninety nine for the full set. But something like Shadow Effects or one of the one of the little pieces in there will do what you want. Uh, the problem is I've got a 4K here we go. TV yeah. I've had since 2014, Yeah, and I'm starting to get burning since I use it as my monitor. Yeah. And the uh, what comes up, whether it's uh, MSN.com or Yahoo. You, oh, you want to, I get it. You want to modify it so that you don't burn in on the screen. Right. Yeah, so any uh, the problem is going to be the icons more because any 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 yes. changing wallpaper will change the desktop. It's the icons that are going to cause you problems. Yes. Um, I well, so they have a, a program. Stardock sells a program called Deskscapes. It okay. is uh, uh, ten dollars. That, okay. that moves a lot of the things. I don't know if it's going to move the icons. It's got animation. It's got all sorts of styles. I would look at star star d-o-c-k doc dot com. They'll have something something similar to that. I'm looking at a video of a like a looks like a undersea uh, seaweeds and Ooh. they're and they're moving uh, behind the the screen. That's kind of cool. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Yes, yeah. I've been using you know screen wipes off. Uh YouTube. Yeah. There are a whole series of, you know, burn in and pixel yeah, fixes. Sure. But, you know, I want something that means I don't have to keep doing that. Right. Uh, you know, and certainly your your windows will turn off the screen and the icons, and that's the best thing you can do after a while. But if you want to have, and if it's on a big screen, it's kind of nice to have maybe an aquarium. There are aquariums behind there, very high resolution. It looks like real fish on your TV. Um, yeah. And by the way, the Stardock uh, website. Uh, also links to a site called Win Customize, where others have put up their animated desktops. So there's a lot of choices up there. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. Sure. Yeah. It comes zoop. Yeah, I mean, if anybody does that, it's going to be Stardock. They're uh, they're the they're the kings of this. I don't run any of these because they just kill your CPU. <laughs> they're just vicious. But um, this thing says easily add motion to static wallpapers using DreamMaker. Use WMV and Dream files with Deskscapes to supply animated video wallpapers. 
I don't know if for a screensaver this is the best thing. Screen, what a screensaver does is designed specifically to prevent burn-in because it hides the icons and then it's you know, showing you stuff. There's a lot of these. There's a lot of these things. Or maybe use multiple desktops, one with all the icons on one and... Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. You know, he's got it on a big screen. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing. I wonder if this has the. Uh, there's a really wild screensaver for uh, Linux. I don't think it's installed. I'll have to install it. Yeah, that was written by um, Jeremy Zawadny, JWZ. Let's install that. to reboot anyway. I've got a new version of Linux 4.8 it looks like. Our show today brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. Oh, I love Rocket Mortgage. If you're going to buy a house or refi, you're going to get a mortgage, right? And the thing about a mortgage is strangely enough with a lot of these companies, it's still a process locked into the 19th century, you know. <laughs> It's still a very paper driven, right? And you got, you know, loan rates and all this stuff. Quicken Loans has figured out a better way. Quicken Loans, first of all, one of the greatest lenders in the country. And now they've created Rocket Mortgage for you, for the geek, somebody who wants to do it all online. No paperwork. Do it all online at Rocket Mortgage. It brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast, it's powerful. It's completely online. You can submit pay stubs and bank statements with a touch of a button. You'll get approved for a custom mortgage solution that's designed for you, and you'll do it in minutes. They show on the website, if you go to quickenloans.com slash tech guy, a couple looking at a house and deciding to take it alone while they're looking at the house, and it's that fast, and you go to the realtor, see, see, I'm approved. <laughs> By the way, that makes a big difference from the buyer's point of view. And I know I've sold a few houses in my time. If I know I've got somebody, a buyer, who's real, who's got approval, that's a big advantage over somebody said, oh, yeah, we want the house, but we're going to get the loan when we get home. Quickenloans.com slash tech guy for Rocket Mortgage Equal Housing Lender. Licensed in all 50 states. NMLSConsumeraccess.org number 3030. You're a, you, you're a digital person. You, you lead a digital lifestyle. Why should your mortgage be any less? Do it all online at Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Quickenloans.com slash tech guy. We thank them so much for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. LCDs, you know, nowadays burning isn't the issue it used to be. On CRTs really was where it was. Yeah, that's true. There you go. Golem says, take all your desktop icons, put them in the anything you want access to, put them in the taskbar, and then set the taskbar to auto-hide. Then you just have a plain, clean desktop. And then you can have this wallpaper going on. Yeah, of course. That's why. Yeah, there was a nasty Linux kernel bug that had been there for nine years. The dirty cow. So I'm rebooting. Always a risk. You don't normally need to reboot Linux after updates, but the exception, of course, is when you get a new Linux kernel. You, the kernel is, you don't have to reboot, but it won't be active until you, oops. But there's always a risk that it won't work with the hardware. Uh-oh. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, I'm reaping what I sowed. <sighs> Shoot, I forgot I'd modified the LVM. And now it's not booting. It says, no, you got a bad member. I don't really have the time to... Look up the LVM commands to delete that member. I might have to or won't boot. Oh, should never have rebooted. Never reboot in the middle of a show. That's my new motto. I have to get John to bring the Mac back. Come on. So the reason I was doing this is I had a, um, I have an NVMe 512 gig boot drive, but also this machine has inside it um, two uh, 
terabyte SSDs. And what I, yeah, crap. Sure, this is easy to fix, but I don't have the time to figure it out. And what I did is I, um, um, it was I added the uh, one of the terabyte uh, to the LVM, but I didn't expand into it yet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Asked Leo, the future's so bright, I gotta wear VR goggles. Eric on the line, Richmond, uh, Virginia, Washington, somewhere. It's all mixed up in here. Hi, Eric. Where are you? Richland, well, Wa Richland, on. Washington. There you go. I can read it now. I, I hope I'm coming in. I'm driving safely in the Columbia River Gorge. There you go. Uh, on hands free in my car. So nice. You uh, pleasure, sound great. Pleasure and honor to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, software for video editing, 4K that you can speed up, slow down, zoom in, you know, to observe. And it sort of ties in with the second question. Have you ever considered doing any drone technology, you know, if, not on this show. We actually have a show called Know How that uh, Father Robert Balliser uh, hosts. We call him the Drone Father because he is such a drone fanatic. And uh, if you go on to youtube.com slash knowhow, you will see many of his videos on creating drones, using drones. He's a wizard of driving drones. I've seen him do things with drones even inside the studio that, uh, you know, every time I use a drone, it crashes. I even I, got the I drone. You can't crash the bebop, the the uh, Parrot AR bebop, and I crashed it. The first thing. You're 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 talking about VR, and I think that's one thing that the drone industry is really you know the FPV, the the first person view goggles that have been around. If you ever uh, watch, and there this is a fun event, drone racing, where oh, these it's insane. it's insane. These guys are going very very fast. And the only way to do this, because, of course, you're not in the drone, you're looking at uh, the drone's cameras to, to pilot it, is to wear VR goggles. And then the experience is terrifying. You're in the drone. And it's as if yeah. you're moving hundreds of miles an hour. And they do it in stadiums and other places where there's lots of room. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah, they wear, they wear... That's a good use for VR. I'm not saying there aren't good niche uses for VR. There are lots of them. Uh, but but it, it definitely, you know, that you were talking about the latency, and that's where I think in that industry that they have progressed immensely over just the last couple years of, of group that because it's the only way to race in a, an environment that they do in these states. Oh, yeah, it has to be real time. Virtually yeah. zero yeah. latency. I mean, it's. Yeah, they've they absolutely latency has totally been improved. I've, I got the Oculus, uh, you know, the first Oculus, the first developer platform. Play with it. I have now the the release platform. There's massive improvements. Doesn't help the nausea, particularly since I don't think latency is the only cause of the nausea. It's one of the causes, but um, you know, it's it's much improved. Um, now your your question was you want to do 4K video editing? Is that it? Yeah, well, and, I've I've got a drone, and that's ah. a potential business where, you know, I'm I'm looking at, at developing a business where we're doing high def high definition inspections of objects. Nice. And we would like to be able to, you know, for a client, you know, that if they have a piece of software that we can hand off video to them, where they can zoom in, look at video, inspect. Oh, so you have another, oh, that's interesting. So it's not just editing. You want them to be able to say stop, enhance, zoom, enhance, exactly. zoom. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, hmm. So, um, okay. Um, I mean, most video editors will allow you to edit 4K video. You'll need a lot of hardware to do it, obviously, because there's a huge amount of data. Um, but I'm, but I'm, now, this is interesting, this issue of you would like them to be able to interact with the 3D scene. I don't, you know, I don't know. This is, um, this is beyond my, uh, my ken. Chat room, is anybody working with drone video in this particular way? Yeah, like Blade Runner. In, 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 zoom, enhance, center. Zoom, enhance, center. Yeah, you know, if, if we're doing a bridge inspection and, you, you know, we're doing a, 
you know, a, a 10 minute flyover or a five minute flyover on a bridge. Cause then, and it's the one thing with 4k resolution is that you have the ability to, to get a, a lot of information at a, at a far enough distance yeah. and do it quick enough to make it, you know, cost effective. But a client may go, hey, we want to look at a particular span or something right. like that. Zoom in on that particular part. Certainly, you can do it before the fact in edit. If you knew that, oh, they were going to want to stop and look at this joint, the, the any video editor would let you slow down, pause, zoom, crop, and do all of that. The problem, the difficulty is what you want is you want to do it after the fact. You give them the content, and then they can do it at will. That's going to be right. challenging. That's going to be challenging. F and Dunn in our chat room says Matterport 3D camera. That's used for real estate in a similar way. Exactly. Uh, I, I could, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is, um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's really what it is would be a function of the player. So you're going to make this 4K video. You're going to direct the drone. The camera's going to capture what it captures. What you want is a video stream that then the player as it's playing it can pause that's not hard every video player will do that zoom in i would bet most video players can do that um so what we really need is a good is a video player that can handle the 4k video and give the viewer the kind of control that you're looking for i bet you there's a lot of choices maybe even something as common as vlc uh will do that I'm wondering, again, I'm going to ask the chat room for help on this one. Because I'll tell you what, keep listening, and we'll, we'll come up with an answer for you. And when we do, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it on the radio, maybe somebody will call 8888-ASK-LEO, say, oh, I'm doing exactly that for bridge inspections or realty or whatever. Uh, or we'll put it in the show notes at techguylabs.com. You can even go there after the fact. If you're listening to the show and the show's over, maybe you're watching the podcast or something, techguylabs.com. Go to the last or uh, second to last call in hour number one of uh, this is show 1334. That's how we break down the website by day, by show, by hour within the show, and by caller within the hour. So you can go there and go leave your comments and your suggestions. What would be? It's a player. I think it. I think most video players would be able to do something similar. You certainly. I mean, anytime you're looking at video, you can pause it, right? Can't, what we're looking for merely is a player that can pause it. And then in zoom in. We can leave the enhance for, for Blade Runner. And certainly that's, it's Creamy Corn Cobb in the chat room saying that's what the NFL does when you watch a football game. That's the nice thing about 4K. 4K, if you're capturing a 4K video, you can think of it as four 1080p videos. You know, in, a, in kind of in a quadrant. So even if you zoom in, four times you're still getting high def 1080p video so you absolutely uh, absolutely can do that um, and i would bet there's there's at least a few video players that can do it we'll, we'll look for you stay tuned the answer will emerge in time eric have a safe and fun drive it sounds like a beautiful drive on a day like today chat room is chewing on this uh this question of we need a video player that lets you pause everyone does that and zoom pause and then zoom in i think most would do that wouldn't they does vlc do that does quicktime do that used to sad thing about apple's quicktime video player used to do so much and they took a lot of those features out hmm. 8888 ask leo I, if you've got a suggestion i'll take it we'll take more of your calls too and chris marquardt our photo guy coming up in half an hour lots more still to come with me leo laporte the tech guy you're out. All right, Archandra. I got to fix my computer. Probably the more important thing he'd need would be high frame rate. Because if he wanted, right. he said he wanted to slow it down. So if he did like yeah. 90 frames. Per you want high frame rate and 4K. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see. What does it say? No device specified for hibernation. Mount. Unknown file system type LVM2 member. Crap. What did I do? So if I... How can I... What I should probably do... LV reduce. Not LV reduce. Probably LV remove, I'm guessing. Yeah, I got an iMac over there. Yeah, I might need the iMac. <laughs> no, wait a minute. We can fix this. So first, I'm going to do... Uh, LSBLK. 
No, what is it? How do I list the block devices? God, I can't even remember any commands. Uh, well, I can do f disk dash l. Oh, it doesn't have anything. Oh, I have no commands. Oy, oy, oy. Hmm. I'm in the root file system. Oh, I, did I did I hose this? I forgot to finish. I started. I was started this LVM expansion, and I did, and then I walked away from it like last week. What did I do? Yeah, bring me the bring me the iMac. I'll fix this later. The Matterport player lets you move through a scene similar to Google Street View, but that's a um, that's a still. That's a still. So you're right. He wants a high frame rate, high res video, and a player that will allow the user, after the fact, viewing the video to slow it down, to zoom in. I would guess. I bet you. I would be shocked if VLC didn't allow you to do that. Yeah. There you go. VLC has an interactive zoom mode. Thank you, user 6962. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, and all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo. We'll be talking a little bit about virtual reality, too. And uh, we were talking before the uh, commercial uh, break uh, about, well, an interesting idea, kind of a science fiction idea that actually is kind of doable, Right now, the idea that you could record video with uh, with a drone, okay, flying above us, a very steady platform, because they've got it's a quadcopter, right? So you're flying a quadcopter. Nowadays, they have very good cameras, high res 4K. That's four times the resolution of a high def camera. And by the way, Peter's here in the studio visiting and he suggested and I think you're right high frame rate would also be very useful you know as high a frame rate as you can and certainly there are cameras my, my, my camera phone in some cases could do 120 frames per second or more so you know, choose that shoot the video then give it to a client let's say it's a, a bridge and your client wants to inspect it to make sure that all the bolts are in <laughs> So you fly around the bridge, you give it to the client. Now, what the client wants to do is play back that video, but occasionally pause it and zoom in at it, or maybe play it back in super slow-mo. So we need, really, I think that's a, that's a characteristic of the player. And in fact, and thank you to the chat room, uh, and I, I speculated that VLC, which is my favorite free player written by French schoolboys, you find it at videoland.org, and uh, and VLC, which stands for Video Land Client, it's a name that uh, it's ironic. It really is kind of a historic and historic name has to do with what they originally thought this software would be, which is some sort of weird video client server system. And the player was the client, Video Land, the idea of playing video over your local area network. And there there was a server. There may even still be a Video Land server. And then their client would be the thing that's playing it back. It turns out the video land client is so hideously useful that everybody, Mac, PC, even Linux has it, even Android and iOS has it because you can play back all sorts of stuff with it. Well, it also turns out as I speculated, it does have that feature that we're looking for, that ability to not only pause but zoom in. Now you may have to enable it and we're going to put a link in the show notes at techguylabs.com. So what you do is you shoot this video as high a resolution as you can, as high a frame rate as you can, deliver it to your client and then tell your client, now, if you use this player, VLC, free player, and you might have to set it up for the client initially, uh, you can pause, pan, zoom, tilt, just like Blade Runner. Zoom, center, enhance. There you go. I think we solved it. Thank you to the chat room for coming up with that one. Conrad's our next caller in Louisiana. Hi, Conrad. Yeah, how's it going there? It's going great. How are you? Good, good, good. I'm I'm not as tech savvy as you are. I was calling to find out about these uh, cellular boxes. Uh, my my daughter and, and son in law they bought us uh, me and my wife cell phone and uh, give them to us. And so anyway, we've been using them here for quite a while. They got these prepaid plans they got, 
And uh, anyway, uh, from what I understand, when you go with the contracted phones there, they you get somewhat of a better reception. On the I don't think that's true, actually. I think the phones are the same. Yeah. It's just how you're paying, whether you pay as you go, pay ahead of time, or pay after the fact. And uh, as you know, now, admittedly, a lot of times when you get a, sometimes they call these go phones, these, you know, uh, pay as you go phones. Uh, they're not the best phones. They're less expensive, cheaper phones. But truthfully, sometimes the lower price phones have better antennas uh -huh. than, than, you know, these sexy, super thin, you know, uh, black, uh, shiny black piano, black iPhone 7, because cosmetically, an antenna line is so ugly. <laughs> And so the expensive phones often do not have as good an antenna as the inexpensive phones. No, so I, 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 now, if you're not, now, are you on a, one of the big four carriers, Ryzen, AT&T, Sprint, or T-Mobile? Yeah, what it, what it is, we're on uh, what they call AT&T, and we've got the uh, iPhone 5s. Oh, as you're the, fine. As the phones we got. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I thought, you know, maybe it might be a little cheaper and, you know, if we went with the plan, but we went down there, they want to run you credit, this and that, which is fine. I mean, yeah, no, no, no. I think Play As You Go is fine. You got an iPhone 5, that's actually a very good phone, uh, and you're on AT&T. The other thing maybe your friends are thinking of is if you get it from a reseller, not AT&T, but somebody who resells AT&T service, like uh, Straight Talk from Walmart, something like that, um, sometimes that is prioritized lower for data than the main one. But you're getting it from AT&T. You're getting every bit of service that anybody else in AT&T is getting. It doesn't matter how you're billed. Okay, okay. Yeah, they, they kind of scared me. I went down to the AT&T, and I, when I got down there, they, they told me, we'll run your credit and this and that. And I said, well, you know, how much are we going to have to pay for a phone? And they said, oh, we'll split it up between the, the months, you know, or whatever, you know, and this and that. And I thought, good grief, you know, it's going to be another $20 every month, you know. If, uh, if you know, know we the they try to hide this, but if you really think about it, the most expensive computer you will ever buy is your smartphone. I'll be. You know, that iPhone 5, uh, when it came out, was seven, six or 700 bucks, and then you're paying, you know, 50, 60, 70 bucks a month for data. That phone over a two-year period is thousands of dollars. So you're, I don't blame you at all. It's ridiculous. Uh, we pay a lot for these smartphones. In fact, we pay more for a smartphone than you pay for your laptop or your desktop computer. So, but I think you did the right thing. You, you, you. Uh, I think you probably got the best deal you can get. Yeah, I, I mean, I like it. Got real good, uh, real good pictures. You know, you can take. Uh, oh, it's a wonderful camera. Now, how's your connectivity? Is it pretty good? I mean, are you worried because you're not getting good service, or you just worried about what might happen? Well, no. It. it I went to go by. The problem was is is uh, I went to go buy a phone case for my phone because I dropped it, and when I dropped it, the, the case itself broke. Oh, good. <laughs> Better the case than the phone. Right. You know, so the phone was saved, which was a great thing, but when I started looking for accessories and everything, you got to kind of dig kind of hard, you know, to, to find <laughs> accessories because when you go to the Best Buys and some of the big... Oh, they overcharge stores, you for a plastic case right. $60 right. for something that costs them a nickel so I don't ever buy from the best buys or from the phone stores when I get cases I get them on Amazon and I get cheap they're ten dollar cases and they're fine look at a company called Rinky R-I-N-G-K-E like Rinky Dink but they're okay. not Rinky they make eight dollar nine dollar rubber cases they're clear you put your phone in it and it protects it now the only difference is it's only protecting the corners and the back. It's not protecting the front. Of course, you know that's a big plate of glass. Glass is fragile. So if you are prone to dropping it, you may want to spend a little more and get a case that has a cover. Don't put a, don't put a film cover on the, on the glass. I don't like doing that, and I don't think that protects you. Get a case that has an open and closed cover. That way you can open it and use the phone, but, but normally when you're carrying it around, it's got a cover on it, and that'll protect it better. Yeah, well, you know, back in my younger days, you know, when you went and got a phone uh, from AT&T or whoever you like, uh, you know, usually if you had good credit or whatever, they would just give you a phone, <laughs> you know, say, so here's yeah. a free phone, and you paid, you know, whatever per month. Well, that's the key. They didn't really give you a phone. Right. They charged you monthly. They hid the cost of it. And the reason they don't do that anymore is because 
consumers got mad. You're hiding in Congress. You're hiding the cost of the phone. So people aren't really seeing the real cost. And I think it's good that you see that these phones are really expensive because you're yeah, paying for it one way or the other. You're not getting it for free. AT&T right. is not business in business to give you anything free. That's right. That's right. That <laughs> they got to pay eighty-five billion dollars for that Time Warner deal. They they're not giving you a free phone. Hey, I have to run. I have to run, Conrad. I hope that helps. Don't worry. It sounds like you got a good phone. The iPhone five is excellent, and you. And I hope you got a good price on it. And and you absolutely are getting the same service that anybody is, whether they bill you later or you pay month to month or you pay ahead of time and get a Go phone. That should be exactly the same service. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. Thank you. That was <laughs> so. I hope that made you feel better, Conrad. You still there? Did I lose you? Oh yeah. Otter boxes are, good Otter boxes are great, but they're very expensive. They're sixty or seventy bucks. But and they're bulky. But that's what I make my daughter use. And it's so I don't know if you heard the story. She had it for two years. She's had her iPhone or a year. She's had her iPhone. She used to break every phone, and she hadn't broken it because she had an Otter box with a lid. And then she takes it off to clean it. First thing she does, drop the phone and break it. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hey, Leo, how are you? Can I'm you hear me? Great. I hear you great. Yeah, what's up? Wonderful. Uh, quick question. There's a documentary filmmaker here who is uh, doing a documentary about uh, podcasters and creatives, uh, network creatives here. And he's, uh, he's just next to me right now filming. And uh, he was wondering if it was possible to get uh, some of the footage of this Tech Guy segment sure. that you're going to record with me. Yeah. Do you, are you under CC license or...? Uh, it's yeah, but I give him a license to use it. It's not CC. It's uh, it's a little bit restricted. It's CC, uh, no derivatives, non-commercial. But All right. um, but he can. But I but I hear. My name is Leo Laporte, and I give you permission to use this video, Mr. Filmmaker, in any way you want. What's his name? <laughs> his name is um, Mark Litz. Mark Litz. I give you yeah. and only you, Mark Litz, the right <laughs> to edit this video for your use in this fine documentary about my good, close, personal friend, Chris, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Is it possible to get a hold of the originals, like of a better well, we quality? Can, yeah, what we YouTube? can give you is um, yeah. what we call the mezzanine file of this. Uh, sounds perfect. Sounds and perfect. It's not the, it's not, it's, the, otherwise it'd be too big for you, but the mezzanine. Not the raw bits? What? You want the raw no, bits? It's good. You can have the raw <laughs> no, bits. No, of course not. Uh, no, that's wonderful. That's great. We'll have to send it to you on a hard drive, but I can send you the raw no, bits. The mezzanine no, itself not. is um, usually it's about 500 gigabytes. <laughs> it's pretty big. So um, I will, yeah. Um, who do I, all, who do all, I all tell is, to do that? All we need is the segment, just, just a 10 minute segment we do. Yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Keith is next in New Hampshire. Hello, Keith. Hey, thank you, Leo, for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Uh, well, several things, but <laughs> most importantly, I just upgraded my 42-inch plasma yeah. to a 55-inch LG. Nice. It, it's not 4K. That's fine. But that's a, it's 1080. It's great. I forgive you. <laughs> thank you. Um, however, I've noticed streaming and Netflix um, every two minutes or so, that I get a blurry screen. Yeah, Netflix does that. It's weird. It's annoying to me. Um, so Is I have it a just Netflix. It's Netflix. <clears throat> it's a bandwidth thing, but you have plenty of bandwidth now. If you go to fast.com, that's Netflix bandwidth tester. And you can run, just go to fast.com. It'll tell you what your bandwidth is, and it'll tell you if you can see HD video. I'm sure you can. The problem is, for some reason, and so Netflix is adaptive. In other words, it will send you the best stream you can handle. But for reasons I don't fully understand, it always starts from zero. So I'm watching House of Cards, one of my favorite shows on Netflix. Great show. It's a 4K show. It should be great. But when it first starts in the credits... It looks horrible. And then you watch it, and slowly Netflix gets it and goes, oh, you have more bandwidth. Let's try a little more and a little more. And it slowly gets better and better, finally gets to 4K, and stays at 4K. Is that the experience you're having where it starts at the beginning, that it's blurry, and then it gets better? Actually, no. It's actually worse because it starts fine. Oh, and it gets and worse. you're watching every two minutes throughout the entire movie, so that's Every few minutes gets blurry. That's Netflix and, saying to you, your bandwidth is inconsistent. Well, 
I have Xfinity, so yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> Are you using Wi-Fi or wired to your TV? It's Wi-Fi. However, I have 75 megabits per second uh, Wi-Fi. And I, I just upgraded my router to an Asus uh, 1750. Oh, good router. Okay. So router. the problem yeah. with Wi-Fi, we've experienced... We, so. Uh, we're kind of on the bleeding edge with Wi-Fi because we do Skype with a lot of our hosts. Chris Marquardt's coming up. He's calling from Germany. He'll be on Skype. Uh, all the podcasts we do, many of the hosts are on Skype. And what, we've, what we tell our uh, hosts is you may not use Wi-Fi. And here's the reason. Normally, you wouldn't notice it. Surfing, email, you wouldn't notice it. But Wi-Fi drops out every once in a while. The fact that it's doing it every two minutes doesn't sound like it's Xfinity to me. It sounds like... It's the Wi-Fi, your router, pausing briefly, enough to tell Netflix, you know, to drop some packets and to tell Netflix, oh, oh, and then Netflix is going to go back to its adaptive low res because it doesn't need as much bit, and then it's going to see it, uh, oh, it's back again and come back. The fact that it's doing it on a consistent every two minutes indicates to me that it's more likely your router than Xfinity. Xfinity wouldn't be doing that. So one way to test that... I love my router. I know you love your router. I know you love your router. And I know also that, unfortunately, it's not next to the TV, is it? It's directly below the TV. Why aren't you using wired? I should be. Yeah. And I, and I can do Cat5. Yeah. By so that's the Cat test. Five. Yeah, yeah. You just get a, get a Cat5 cable. If you're like yeah. me, you've got a bunch in a drawer somewhere. Just get a Cat5. Yeah, it comes with everything, right? Just get a yeah. Cat5 cable. And this is the best way to test it. And just plug it in. And if suddenly that stops happening, then it is, you know, Wi-Fi. Now, those Asus uh, routers have something called QoS, quality of service, which is a way to prioritize packets. A good router will let you say, hey, this is streaming video. This is higher priority than my email. In fact, that may be what's yeah. happening. If it if the Cat5 cable doesn't fix it, then some other device may every two minutes be checking your email, you know, doing something every two minutes that's using up bandwidth that's causing your... Because remember, it's shared inside your house. Correct. Even yeah. if you have 75 megabits, it's shared. I when we used to... <laughs> I used to bring the whole network, the whole studio down because I would collect my mail every 10 minutes... And it would suck so much bandwidth that everything else would go. So it, so the first thing to try is put in a, put in a cable. Just do it wired. Your TV will like I you will. better anyway. And if that doesn't it's fix probably, it, then look at what else is going on in your network. It's, it's, uh, well, I mean, we have up to 20 devices at a time. So. Yeah, see, that's good. That could yeah. be. There's, well, that's why I got the Asus on your recommendation. So It's a great um, router, and it does have QoS. QoS would say, hey, I don't care where you're, where you're getting email. I'm watching TV here. I'm watching here. And it would <laughs> and it would say, don't slow me down. Absolutely. Hey, I have I have one more question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I have a, a, on Verizon, I have a Samsung Galaxy S6. Been a great, great, great phone. Fantastic. Good. However, um, I'm considering possibly for 199 bucks getting a uh, the Google 5X um, and going to, going on Google Fi. I'm a fan. Um, I'm a fan. It, will I be disappointed? Well, I can't promise. You. <laughs> I can't promise not to disappoint you. I disappoint people all routinely, but I will tell you this. So Google Fi is really Google's attempt to say this could be better, right? And we all agree, the cell phone companies are terrible, right? They could uh -huh. do a better my, job. My, my, my bill is crazy. Yeah. So the way Google does it, 20 bucks flat fee for the phone, and that includes unlimited phone calls within the U.S., unlimited text within the U.S. And then you pay 10 bucks a gigabyte for data. And you pay for whatever you use. If if today, this month, you use half a gigabyte, you pay five bucks. A quarter of a gigabyte, you pay two fifty. If you use ten gigabytes, you pay a hundred bucks. You pay for what you use. And my experience has been in general that that means I'm gonna get a lower bill. It also is great if you travel because it's the same price in 140 different countries. So you suddenly have a phone that, does, that no longer costs you more to travel. The, the other thing that's different and may or may not be good for you is it uses not one service but three. It uses Wi-Fi if it can. 
both for calling or for uh, for data. T-Mobile, if yes. if that's the strongest. Sprint, if that's the strongest. And actually, U.S. Cellular, if that's the strongest. So most areas of the country, that because you're going to get to choose from a variety of different services, you're going to have pretty good coverage. There are areas, though, and I don't, you know, I, I I'm not sure about. Uh, you're in um, New Hampshire. That's a traditionally difficult area. Yes, because there's a lot of rural stuff. There are areas yeah. where T-Mobile and Sprint and U.S. Cellular don't have a good signal. In which case, Verizon, you, Verizon, very strong out here. Right. So that's yeah. why I can't promise not to disappoint you because it may be it's not as good as Verizon in that particular area. In general, it is going to be better. Certainly here it is. In where we are in Northern California, it is. But you're right. Uh, because you're in a challenging area, it may be that that would be a mistake. Uh, yeah. I don't know if Google gives you a trial. They're supposed to. Every self company, I think, is required to give you a two-week trial. So inquire about that. Well, for 199 bucks. Could I not say no? I mean, come on. I know. it's a, And the 5X is a very nice phone. Battery life, not great. But, you know, most well, Android phones don't have great battery life. I was going to say my Galaxy S6 is not great either. Yeah, most so. phones don't have great battery life. Great great phone. Great phone. Yeah. Not, not a good battery. Yeah, I think, you'll, I think you'll be happy with the 5X. Not as good a camera as the S6. <laughs> that has an amazing camera. Um, but I think you'll like Google Fi. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt yeah. coming up. Thank you. Our sponsor today, Sonic, they literally bring you the the, uh, the Twit podcasts because our Sonic internet is the fastest. It's amazing. We have, believe it or not, 10 gigabit fiber to our premise. And uh, I'm just going to show you. Uh, here's I'm going to fast.com. This is Netflix's new uh, speed test. And I just like it because it's got a big number. How fast is my internet today? It's only 670 megabits per second. I've gotten all the way up to 930 megabits per second. Believe me, it's fast on our sonic 10 gigabit fiber internet i am a huge fan of dane jasper and the whole team at sonic i've been a sonic customer well we all at the brick house we were sonic we had uh, i had sonic at my house i think 10 years long time they've been around a long time and they are literally in my opinion the best internet service provider in the u.s we, you know I, we talk about all the time how poor our internet infrastructure in the u.s is too many people paying too much for unsatisfactory cable internet with bandwidth caps and they're snooping on you. Not Sonic. Sonic delivers fast, affordable internet, phone, and TV to homes and businesses all over California. Their mission to bring internet freedom to all. Never limited, never capped internet at the highest speeds you've ever seen, at the lowest price you've ever seen. Listen to what you get. Sonic delivers residential and business fiber to the premise networks. Gigabit connectivity. Gigabit connectivity. We have 10, but that's kind of overkill. But <laughs> you get gigabit. That's plenty. Believe me, you're faster than most sites out there. Many. All, probably. Uh, they offer it in San Francisco, the North Bay Area, the East Bay Area, and they're expanding. I hope to your area soon because this is what you get. Fifth, you get the internet service, gigabit internet. You get 15 email accounts. You get a gigabyte of storage. You get personal web hosting with a new domain and fax line service. You get unlimited local and long-distance telephone, no bandwidth caps. They defend you, and if, if anybody wants to snoop on you, they say no, $40 a month. If, now, see, the only problem I have with talking about this is <laughs> most of you can't get it, and it's probably driving you crazy. By the way, if you want to get if you get the phone service, it's you can port your number so you keep your existing phone number. It's easy to switch from your carrier. Sonic.com slash twit. Sonic stands up for privacy, for friendly local customer support, uncapped bandwidth, and affordable pricing for all. And their customer advocacy is paving the way for a better state of internet access in the United States. I want to really honor them. We did a great triangulation with their uh, founder and president. Dane Jasper, watch that if you can. And just check it out. EFF rates them the best. Rightly so. Sonic.com slash twit. Receive your first month of Sonic Internet and Phone Service free, plus bundle with Dish, and you'll save 120 bucks on your Sonic bill. So you can get TV too. Sonic.com slash twit. 40 bucks for gigabit Ethernet, 15 email accounts, unlimited phone service, personal web hosting, fax line service, and on and on and on. And no bandwidth caps. Sonic.com slash twit.
We love you, Sonic, and thank you for making all of this possible. All right, let me get my Chrome going, because if I get my Chrome going, I'm going to get my LastPass going. If I get my LastPass going, I'm going to get my fast mail going and if I get my fast mail going I am going to get Chris's now do you have a do you have a video feed for me oh you do you are so good you are so good is it yeah it looks like it is good. nice look at that look at that look at that baby that's Sierra that's Sierra now it's going to do this thing which I will do here we'll see if we can do this before Chris's thing There's my login. Did you break the TriCaster again? No, I broke my Linux box <laughs> by Oops. doing something incredibly stupid. Uh, you? Yes. It's impossible. No, incredibly <laughs> stupid. Uh, by oh shoot, that wasn't what I should do either. Oh. Okay, I'm not gonna talk. You just do your oh. thing. Do not talk to the driver. Whoopsie, whoopsie, whoopsie. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I uh, just refused permission to the Mac. But now what I'm going to do, the problem is, the other thing is I didn't bring my Pixel with me. Yes, trying to sign in from another computer? Yes. Okay, good. That's approved. So, got it. Now, the other thing I have to do, uh, yes, start now. Okay. Use Chrome. Is I have to, I have a different sync password for my stuff you know I do this so much that actually it's pretty automatic seems like I'm setting up a new machine every week uh, okay so now Google's Chrome is going to slowly add all my plugins including LastPass so the next step will be to log into LastPass then once I have LastPass I can get my mail and I can get your images and that's the last bit of the puzzle I want the images so Chris you're a fashion icon so I'm going to oh, ask yes, you definitely. and an artist <laughs> an artist is it okay roll my hair back for a man to wear a cloak a cloak <laughs> As in, as in Zorro or Superman or Lisa thinks like, I'm like one crazy. of these, like one of these. Yeah. Uh, are you gonna wear? Do, I, why would you want to do that? I don't know. Is there something wrong with me? I suddenly <laughs> got. Just a, I suddenly got the urge to buy, <laughs> kind of like spy versus spy hats and cloaks. Oh yeah, but if you, if you have a second person next to you doing the the spy versus spy thing, that would be cool. She I think. should get a white cloak. Yeah, well, white cloak, black cloak, pointy nose. All right, I agree to last. Oh no, this is a login. All right, come on. Is this a is this a review? What today? Yeah, talking to me. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. We are doing. Uh, one more secret superpower oh, segment. But it is it. But you do need images. Okay, hold on. Authenticator. I always use. Uh, no, no images today. No photos today. Oh, I saw your email. Oh, the email was about that. The no, the email was about the license for the. Yeah. Uh, oh, so I don't need it. I am not in a podcast documentary. You're that, not. That, I gave you my no verbal pressure. No pressure. Approval. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> okay. What am I doing? Oh, authenticator. <laughs> <laughs> And this yeah. is last oh. pass, and there it is. The magic number is two five one zero. And I uh, trust this computer, please, for thirty days. No, nope, would I ever put you on the spot one. like I did that? The wrong one. Oh, I did the wrong one. And authenticate and go. All right, here we go. Hello, Chris Marquart. Hello, Leo. How Wonderful are you? Wonderful to see you. I am great. How are you? I'm doing good. I've, I'm, I've had a wonderful weekend. We just finished a workshop with uh, a bunch of amazing people doing people photography, teaching about, well, how to shoot pictures of people and how to tell stories with your pictures. And that's, that's kind of what I want to do today. We are still doing the Secret Superpowers series, the Secret Photographic Superpowers series. And uh, I wanted to tell, uh, talk about telling stories with your pictures. Good. You, so, sometimes you see a picture and it just tells you a story, and and it kind of feels like, how, I mean, how how do you do that? How what would you look at 
um, when you shoot a picture to tell a story with the picture. And I believe there are three main things that can help you do that. And uh, the first thing is bringing in some contrast. And I'll go into details what that means in a second. The second is to have a dialogue. And the third is do not uh, to not tell it all right away. So, you know, when you bring in a contrast, and I'm not, not necessarily talking bright versus dark. I'm talking uh, a, con- a content contrast, like what's in the picture. Let's say... Uh, old versus young or something soft versus something hard or something big versus something small or old versus new or east versus west in terms of culture. So those contrasts will always kind of give the viewer something to think about. That's the first kind of thing that will help you tell a story. Um, Bright and dark contrast as well, of course. If you have something very bright and something very dark, that might also help tell a story. So that's the first thing. You also want some is, tension, right? That's the other thing you get from that is a little tension, well, the right? The contrast will tell attention because yeah. that's the second thing. You, you, If you bring in some sort of a dialogue between those two things, that's going to make a picture really interesting. Yeah. Let's say, let's say uh, old versus young. If you have an old hand holding a very young hand, for example, a baby hand, that is just a perfect story right there Um, or something soft and something hard a rock and a snail or uh, something old and something new an old building and a new building next to each other that's a that's a dialogue going on in that picture those two things will in some way talk to each other and the viewer can make up a story Uh, really interesting contrast I had in one of the photos I took in in Tibet was a Buddhist monk who was mending candles in a monastery, but being on a cell phone. Oh, I love so you that. have this you have this old I ancient culture, yeah. and 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 then you have this guy taking out his cell phone and making a call to someone, and that <laughs> it's just, just wow, beautiful, really beautiful, really something. Also, things that point towards each other or things that move towards each other will tell a story because you will continue that line if you have a a vehicle moving from. Uh, left to right, you will continue that in your mind. And then there is something on the right that it might collide with. But you, you're kind of making this up at this point because it's right. not there yet, but you're kind of extrapolating what's going to happen. So this so is really a compositional point. technique. This is, I always think composition means shapes and colors, but it can also mean look for a story and look for contrasts and look for tension. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And yeah. you and you can create a tension by, uh, let's say you have something moving out of a frame. You have a, a, a bicycle that's moving, that, that's not moving into the frame, but it, that's right at the edge, almost leaving that frame. That will start, uh, that, that'll start the viewer's mind going because that, <laughs> that bicycle, well, you have no idea what's behind that edge of the frame. There might be a, a hole that is going to fall in or a wall that is going to run into or you don't really know. So that will definitely create some tension. There is some some uncertainty in it that will create some tension. So that's the second thing. And the third thing that I find really uh, good and really valuable is do not tell it all right away. If you tell the whole story in one picture, the viewer doesn't have to do any any more work. But if you leave something out, if you leave something open to the imagination, uh, uh, if you don't finish that story, you will leave uh, some room for interpretation. The viewer will have to do some work. You kind of force the viewer into doing some work. They will they will they will get active. That's the kind of picture that that the viewer will will look at and then. Uh, then flip to the next one and then go back and go, wait a minute, what's going on there? So leave some room for interpretation. Let let the viewer do some work and that will force them into telling that story. Love that. So the, con- the contrast, dialogue, and the not telling it all. That's how you tell stories. And we and we still have a, a, some storytelling to do on on our on our assignment right what is our assignment scale right what is scale the current assignment is scale and well what is scale i mean that that is this is that there is possibly a contrast in there you know you have oh. maybe scale in terms of the size small, of course yeah. a scale could also be on a snake <laughs> scale <laughs> can mean a lot of different things but but uh just just size wise the scale between different two different things will in itself create a story 
And we do these assignments not because it's a competition. There's no prize. But really, it's just an excuse to get out and take pictures. Because the way to get good at photography is to take more pictures. And it doesn't have to be a fancy camera. In fact, nowadays, the new camera phones, any camera phone, they're really good. And so you can do this picture from a camera phone. But the key is, if you want to participate in the contest, to take the picture and upload it to Flickr. I'm almost embarrassed to say that now, after the trouble Yahoo's been having. Should we try another photo sharing site than Flickr? I don't know. We'll have to talk about that. Uh, but for now, it's Flickr. And uh, if you still have a Yahoo account, most people do. First of all, change your password, just in case. And then turn on two-factor. And then upload a picture. Make sure you put scale in the tag so we know that that's scale. And if it's the one that you want to submit uh, to Chris, and we're going to do a review when? Next week? A couple of weeks? Soon? I, I think it's going to be next week. If you want to get in this review next week, and that's really the only reward is that you might be selected by Chris to talk about, uh, you got to submit it to the Tech Guy group. Renee Silverman's our moderator. She'll welcome you to the group if you're not already a member. You'll know it's the Tech Guy group. There's a picture of me. There's so what, 11,000 members, something like that, thousands of photos it's there. Amazing. Yeah. 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 So do that because we would love next week to talk about your picture illustrating the concept scale. Has Leo taken one yet? No. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Leo. I got to do it. I got to do it. I had all these plans. You know, this is the problem is you can overthink it and never do it. So just get out there and take a picture and I'm going to do the same and we'll get some pictures out there for you next week. Chris Marquardt leads great photography workshops. You can find out about all the workshops upcoming at discoverthetopfloor.com. He's also the host of the best photography podcast, Tips from the Top Floor, tfttf.com, and joins us every week right about this time to talk about photography. As we said, next week, we will review your assignment and how well you've done. Thank you, Chris Marquardt. Absolutely. We'll see you next uh, next time, and thank you all. We'll be back with more of your calls. 8888-ASK-LEO website. We'll put uh, links to uh, Chris's show notes and how you can upload your picture. TechGuyLabs.com. I'm Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Back to the phones. We go. Noberto is in uh, Whittier, California. Hi, Noberto. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? Okay, this is my first experience in contacting you, and uh, it's it's a thrill. <laughs> Thank you. you. Your show is fantastic. Well, I promise um, not to bite. Basically, what it is is um, I'm a retired scientist, and I wrote this book called The Cosmic Factor that is selling well in Amazon and Kindle. Great. And um, since the readers are giving it five stars, I was wondering... How do you get it into Apple and, and expand my uh, my network? Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Are you self publishing this, uh, Norberto, or do you have a publisher? Yes. Through through Create Space, which is subsidiary of Amazon. Amazon. That's why it's not on Apple. <laughs> now I suddenly understand. So uh, Create Space is great. That's uh, the self publishing tool that uh, Amazon offers. It does a really great job. However. One of the disadvantages of that, of course, is it's 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 for Amazon, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're probably smart to try to get it on the iBook store. Although, frankly, getting on Amazon is probably the biggest the biggest thing. Um, now, it, well, this is a novel. Yeah, it's a, um, actually it's a um, science fiction novel uh, supported by scientific fact, and I, I love that's my favorite kind of sci-fi. I love right, because you you have a, like fantasy like Harry right. Potter and all that. No, right. this one is is a fictional novel, but it's supported by scientific facts. In fact, I have a cosmic hypothesis throughout the story that I seriously insert at the end of the book nice. that relates the history of human knowledge with the logarithmic shape of our galaxy. Now what what kind of scientist uh, were you, uh, Noberto? Well, my major was chemistry and mm -hmm. specialized in in. Uh, 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 inorganic chemistry and metallurgy. Interesting. I did, I did a lot of lab work with instruments. Interesting. Uh, and, and this is all about parapsychology and UFOs. I love this stuff. And I love, they call it hard science fiction, where, where the science is genuine and real and there's a lot of it. I always enjoy right. that kind of science fiction. 
Well, I'll no, read it. Uh, now, getting it on iTunes, I think do you you probably have the original files of it, right? Yes. So the I, good. Yeah. I have the, the the yes the the original manuscript. Yeah. So um, Apple has its own uh, tool called iBooks Author, a free tool that's comparable to the uh, tool that you used for CreateSpace. Um, mm. And and basically, Apple does let you do self-published works, but the key is going to be the format. Um, so here's what I would do. If you go to uh, apple.com, uh, you can actually, they have a whole explanation on putting your own books on the iBooks store. You have to sign up. You have to enable your iTunes, or I'm sorry, your Apple account for I, what's something called iTunes Connect. And then it'll tell you what format you need to put it in. Uh, yours is probably in, do you sell it on Kindle? Yes, they think yeah. so. It's probably in Mobi format, but you might be able to. You might. I'm not sure what Apple requires. It's probably something different. You may even have to open up iBooks Author, which is a free download from Apple. Put the put the text in there, mod, and you probably want to do that so that it looks the best, right? Um, right? And so you can go in, put it into iBooks Author, format it, make sure everything makes sense. It does uh, support EPUB, which is a a standard uh, format, so you can easily, I'm sure, using uh, the tools you're already using, convert it from the uh, Amazon Kindle format to the EPUB, EPUB format. Uh, but I would, I would probably not want to do an automatic conversion. You want to make it look as as good as it can in the iBook store. So I think it might be worth getting the iBooks author and just and just running it through there. But yeah, absolutely, get it, get into as many stores as you can. I don't, I don't. My sense of it's interesting. I don't know. Um, my sense is that the iBook store, actually, I shouldn't say I don't know. I'm just, for myself, it's not the first place I look for a book. I almost always look on Amazon. And I use Apple's uh, iBooks mostly. I have bought books there. Um, and one of the things that's pretty cool with, and it might be something of interest to you, is it has many better multimedia capabilities than a Amazon offers. Amazon's really thinking text only because they want to put it on their Kindle, which, you know, even illustrations look terrible on the Kindle. But in Apple, there's a number of, for instance, E.O. Wilson has published a beautiful book on the uh, iBook store that has animation, that has video. It's much more of a multimedia creation. And if you were interested, I think that would be the best way to get attention on the uh, iBook store and certainly get Apple's attention. But, but I don't, I somehow doubt that people make a lot of money on the iBook store. I'm I'm really thinking that Amazon kind of owns this, right? Barnes and Noble had their, you know, had their solution, and I guess it's still around. And, and the there was the Kobo, and there've been a lot of e-readers. But really, come on, let's face it. First of all, the e-reader surprisingly category is dwindling. It's not that e-books are dwindling. E-books, I think, are on the upswing. It's that people aren't buying dedicated devices like the Kindle to read e-books anymore. They just do it on their phone. Or their tablet. And most of them use the Kindle software. Now, if you're an Apple um, user, if you use the iPad or the iPhone, then you might have the iBook store on there. I, but it doesn't seem to have any appreciable benefit. Books aren't cheaper there, are they? I don't think some of them are more expensive. Their uh, selection is not anywhere near as broad as uh, Amazon's. They do have this multimedia advantage, which is pretty cool, but I don't. You know, unless you know you're looking for a book with multimedia content, eh, I think pretty much people, I think you probably got 90% 90, 90 of the market by going on Amazon. My, I'll give a plug to uh, my book now, not my book personally, but a friend of mine's book, uh, Guy Kawasaki, who some of you know is, a, is a, the first Apple evangelist. Uh, he became an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and he's written a book on self-publishing that's very good that has all the ins and outs you need, including which bookstores are the best, which formats are the best. It's called APE, which uh, stands for something sensible, not not monkey APE. It stands for, what, author, publisher, and entrepreneur, something like that. Uh, but it's on, uh, it's on Amazon. It's everywhere. Author, publisher, entrepreneur, how to publish a book. So if you're thinking, yeah, that sounds neat. What Norberto is doing is kind of neat. I wonder if I could do this. You be, I'd be honest. I think you know, and I've written thirteen books with a standard traditional publisher, and I think today you'd be crazy to go to a publisher. 
Unless you think you're, you're the next Danielle Steele and you want to get mass market, do it yourself. And uh, start with uh, start with this because it'll at least give you the ins and outs. And I think it's online at ape a p e ape the book dot com. What do you think? I don't know. I, I, maybe there's authors listening who published on iBooks and have some thoughts about how successful that's been. I just don't, I don't hear pe people doing it. Might be in the uh, chat room is reminding me that the uh, sale we talked about on the last show that was only a rumor in the Wall Street Journal of uh, of um, AT&T buying Time Warner has come true. AT&T is uh, trying to buy Time Warner, which is really just Warner Brothers movies. The TV channels like CNN, HBO, TBS, TNT, and Time Magazine, Mad Magazine. Um, $85 billion, most of it debt or uh, stock swap. And I've seen a number of people say it's just ego on AT&T's part. AT&T, of course, is a dumb pipe company trying to become a content company. And there's good precedent for this. Look at Comcast buying NBC Universal. The content content uh, seems to be the play these days. So I guess that's the theory behind it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? It's time to talk high tech with me, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We talk about computers and the Internet and Windows and Mac and Linux and home theater, digital photography and publishing your books online and smartphones. Smart. I even talk about smart watches. Is this category dead? The smart watch? I think it, de it died. I think it's over. I still s I see people wearing Apple watches. I'm wearing one right now. But it's more like a hobby. <laughs> right? It's more like, um, it's not a necessity by any means. Smartphone, you know, you can make an argument that that's a real advantage to have a smartphone. But everything you would do on a smartwatch, you could do on a smartphone. So I don't, you know, the smartwatch is more like a an adjunct, a sidecar. Anyway, well, I'll talk about that too. 8888 Leo tablets, virtual reality, self-driving cars. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Uh, you can Skype us if you're outside that area. It won't cost you anything because it's a toll free number. And let me uh, remind you about the website because that's a really great resource and it is free. There's no sign up. But anytime I talk about something or mention a site or a product, uh, it will be linked on our website because I have a scribe. My scribe, James DeRuvo, is writing this down even as I speak. He's probably even writing, my scribe, James DeRuvo, hey, that's me, is even as I speak. And he, <laughs> we put that on the website. And then we also put audio and video after the uh, fact. And we encourage your comments because a lot of times so you'll have an, an idea, a better idea maybe than I do. And you want to put that there. And I really appreciate that. That's techguylabs.com. Just think of me in a lab coat with safety goggles. Oh, yeah. TechGuyLabs.com. Uh, Douglas, New York, you're next. Thanks for hanging on. Hi, Douglas Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. What a great show today. And yesterday as well, I was looking at uh, watching you with the Siri and the Google Assistant. Yeah, boy, that was dramatic, wasn't it? Wow. Yeah, that's pretty sad. That is a real... You know, Apple must be cringing. <laughs> Well, I think uh, so, to some degree, Siri is held back by Apple's desire not to snoop on you. So one of the advantages Google has is they've got your mail and they can go through it. They've got your, you know, because they have your phone, they can see where you are. And they're willing to churn that information on their servers to give you more useful information and sure. interact with you. Sure. But they also sure. have a tech, I think, have a technology lead over Apple. And I, that, there's no reason for that. Apple's got plenty of money. Um, I don't know. Maybe they just don't have the best engineers. I don't know. But if, when it, if on a head-to-head -head comparison, Siri is not as good as Google's uh, voice assistant by any means. Right. Right. Well, more will be revealed on that on that uh, technology with Apple. But uh, I have a question. Um, there's a website called Derpy. D i r p y. <laughs> yeah. What does it do? <laughs> I like the name. <laughs> <laughs> it does everything you want it to do and more. And more. Uh, Depending on what browser, actually what it does is it rips audio or video off of YouTube. Ah. 
Yes. It's a, it's a YouTube downloader, and there's quite a few of these. This is one I'm not familiar with, uh, but I will, let, me, let me take a look. Derpy. All right. So you, you give it a URL for a YouTube video, and then you can strip out the, uh, the video right. or the audio and, and download it and have it for permanently. That's right. That's right. And you can put it right in their landing page. A couple questions with this. Um, well, since you're not familiar with it, I'll tell you what the, pro the problems are. Depending on what browser you use, it freezes up. Well, there or you go. <laughs> I'm trying to go there on Chrome right now, maybe because you just mentioned it. It's very slow. Or maybe Google's trying to block it. Uh, there are other Sorry. downloaders for YouTube. Um, yes, please, please, tell me. So um, uh, somebody in our chat, a couple of people in our chat room are saying YouTube DL. It's YouTube dash DL. But I think that is a program... Yeah, it's a uh, it's a open source program that you would run at the command line. So for that, you would need a um, it's in Python. So you 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 can there is a Windows executable that has Python in it. You could do it also on Mac OS X or in Linux because it's a command line. That's YouTube dash DL. If you Google it, you'll go to a GitHub site with the download buttons. Somebody's also recommending uh, yt dash dl dot org. I, I wonder if that's a web-based version. The problem with a web-based version of this, of course, is when the... Yeah, that's the same thing. When the site is down, as Derpy seems to be, because we're all going to it. Remember, Derpy has to do a lot of work. Uh, and it's doing it not on your computer, but it's doing it on uh, server side, on the Derpy side. So YouTube download does it on your side. So basically what it does is it goes to YouTube and gets the video. YouTube's usually up. Right, it's got enough bandwidth, so it gets the video. Then it ch churns on it on your computer using your processor. That's going to be more reliable than the one I've recommended before, which I like is KeepVid, KeepVid.com. Okay. Um, and, and, and is it okay to download, uh, we'll say, a particular artist's music and then put it on top of a home video or something like depends that? Depends what you mean by okay. <laughs> uh, technically, okay, so. The reason that YouTube generally doesn't let you do this is uh, because that's kind of the license that YouTube has. Usually, um, if a site was going to let you download, for instance, Vimeo, which is another commonly used video site, does sometimes let you download. But that's at the at the decision of the person creating the video. So when, when a site doesn't have a download button, pretty much I interpret that as an indicator that they don't want you to download it. There are... Yeah. Now, everybody who creates anything, including videos, has a copyright automatically on it. And unless you state otherwise, that copyright means that it, it, you own the rights to it and somebody can't just download it and use it. Now, as you know, the music industry is pretty adamant about this. So, is there an issue with you downloading a song, putting it behind a video that you only show to family and friends? No. That's personal use and no. The minute you put it in public, then you're in trouble. And so if you, for instance, posted that video on YouTube, YouTube has automated systems to find that video and ding you. And then they'll do it in a couple of different ways, depending on what the record label wants to do. Sometimes the record label says, that's fine, and says, but we want to put some ads on it to try to make some money back. Sometimes they'll say, no, take it down. Uh, right. YouTube does allow people who have copyrights on content to take it down if it's on other places. Right. So, right, right. you know, I it's know a, they do provide content as well. They do yeah, provide. in my opinion, if you download something and use it for personal use, you're fine. It's only when you put it out in public, uh, particularly right. if you do so for commercial purposes, that you're in trouble. Okay. Well, well I have one more selfish question. Okay. I promise I'll let you go. I had a birthday uh, that just passed, and I was wondering if you could send me a quick T-shirt. So I can, uh, probably wear in New York. Well, we sell those. Actually, we don't even have any Twit T-shirts uh, because we sell them through Teespring. So I don't have free T-shirts to send out. But if you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, I'll be glad to send you a picture or a sticker or something like that. Actually, you don't even have to send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. Just email uh, leo at techguylabs.com with your mailing address, and I'll send you a postcard with an autograph on it. That's the best I can do. The T-shirts cost us money, and so we usually we don't we don't uh, sell T-shirts. Um, because that's actually an, believe it or not, expensive proposition because of sales tax. It would be a complicated thing for us to do. 
Uh, so what we generally do, and it's what I recommend anybody who wants to have T-shirts, is we use a company called Teespring. There, there are a number of these, but Teespring really seems to be good. It's a startup, T -E -E -S -P -R -I -N -G. You can design a T-shirt, sell it through them. They do the fulfillment. They handle the sales tax. And then you set a price. You know, they have a base price, which is the cost, including their profit to you. And if you want to make money on it, you can add five bucks or whatever. If you don't want to make money on it, you just, you know, charge cost for it. But it always costs something. Happy birthday, though. But I, I can't I can't afford to send T-shirts out to anybody who wants one. <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, maybe I get the radio station. Somebody will have to absorb that cost. <laughs> eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> You're out. Truthfully, it wouldn't break the bank to send you a T-shirt, but the minute I did that, I would be getting a lot of requests. KeepFit is, uh, I think KeepFit's not, f is it free? Yeah, no. KeepFit does it for a lot of sites, too, which is kind of cool. Not just YouTube. And Facebook. And Daily Motion And SoundCloud. And Vimeo. Now, there, it is a little, I think it's a little sketch to do this. Don't you? Yeah, VLC does it. Yep. VLC has a downloader. I don't know. I, I don't know what the legalities... I guess I have to ask uh, Denise what the legalities are. She's an attorney. She would know. Leo Laporte. The Tech High. 8888. Ask Leo. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or uh, Canada. Debbie on the line from Burbank. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> Bye, Debbie. Did I scare her? Are you still there? <laughs> you know, maybe something just, maybe the battery died. Let me just put you on hold, Debbie, and we'll, we'll get Kim to check on her. Patrick, Palm Beach, Florida. There we go. Hi, Patrick. Well, hello, Leo. Welcome. What can I do for you? Well, um, I might have found the answer to my question. Um, That's why we keep you on hold so long, so that uh, <laughs> you're just sitting there for an hour. You can Google. And... Well, actually, it wasn't, but. 15 minutes, but... Oh, good. Who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> anyway, uh, this is my second call. Okay. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. I'm glad you called. Um, this is a tiny hardware firewall VPN client. Yeah. You you may be familiar with a previous show that you had some advertised. Um, it basically does uh, this type scenario. You're at a public Wi-Fi... Um, you can have it pre-configured because it has two Wi-Fi radios in it. Uh, one side of the radio connects to the public side. The other is your VPN capable or, you know, connected internal Wi-Fi. Keeps you secure. You don't have to worry about logging into anything. I love them. I recommend them. In fact, we've never advertised for them. I've just, I've just talked about them because I think they're... They're making an interesting yeah. and useful product, and uh, I don't well, travel no, without my uh, tiny what hardware is, firewall. Yeah. What's the nomenclature? What is what is that device called? It's a firewall. It's a uh, so it, in firewall. Yeah, I mean firewall. the yeah, it's a it's a firewall. The uh, it's a hardware firewall. So the idea is not unique to this uh, company. It's actually created by a Washington D.C. based uh, VPN company, Hotspot VPN. Uh, and so what they what they do is they buy these uh, inexpensive. Uh, they're they're based on the Marvell chip uh, boxes, and then they they put firmware in them that routes everything through their VPN. And as part of either subscription to their VPN or purchase of the hardware, which includes a subscription, you kind of get this automatically. The disadvantage of this is. It can only use Hotspot VPN. It can't use anybody else. I, I like them as a VPN provider. They're fast. They're effective. Some people may not choose them because, for instance, one of the reasons people use VPN is to bypass geographic restrictions. If you want to watch BBC's uh, video stream on their uh, player, you have to be in the UK. If you're in the United States, you can use a VPN to appear to be in the United Kingdom. 
Uh, and but that's not how this works because Hotspot VPN does not offer that. You can't choose the geography. They also have Tor built in, which is a nice anonymizing network. So the reason I use this is not for geographic restrictions or even anonymizing. I use it because I want to be safe when I'm on an open access point, and it's a very easy. It, the, the, I have the new small one, which actually goes on my keychain. It's just a little USB dongle. Does all the same things. And it's a firewall. And it's really important on open access points to have a firewall because you're really sitting out there in public when you're at an open access point and people can attack you and so forth. So, yeah, I use um, the uh, uh, Tunnel Bear. Tunnel Bear is a not, very nice, very popular uh, VPN, particularly for eliminating geographic restrictions. Yeah, I've found a few times where I used it with my uh, computer at home and it. Um, like, I guess, um, Netflix complained, we don't like this IP, no. even though it is in the U.S. Precisely. So the uh, way people like BBC and Netflix fight back is by banning VPNs. And, yeah, in fact, you won't right. be able probably to get through to the BBC iPlayer very soon because they'll block it. And uh, Netflix has gotten better and better at blocking any VPN use for Netflix. Generally, it's not great for streaming anyway because the VPN means there's an extra hop in there. And that sometimes slows you down enough that you aren't getting really good video. Uh, I do it, again, for, for one reason only, for security. And, um, and I do think if you're going to be spending a lot of time in a hotel or at a coffee shop using their internet, it, it is worth getting. Uh, Tunnel Bear has a free service that you know for a few hundred megabytes a month. So for casual use, that's fine. Tunnel Bear became famous, I think, during the Olympics when people were, f not the most recent Summer Olympics, but four years ago, when people were so frustrated by NBC's Olympic coverage that they wanted to watch streams from other countries and use Tunnel Bear to get through. Sure. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, you know... I. Like, this is very much like the previous call where there are there are legal and ethical issues involved that I don't want to touch. I'll just leave it to you and your conscience about what you feel comfortable doing. But I do like yeah, these tiny hard for the same reason. Yeah, I like the tiny hardware firewall. I just it's very convenient. Once you set it up, it's pretty quick. You'll get to uh, I'll get to a Starbucks. I'll use it to log into this because you know you always have this portal you have to log into and I'll log in through that and then I'll turn on the VPN and now I know I'm secure and I can do anything I want on that network without having people try to hack it. The worst is airport Wi-Fi. I'm very I'm very nervous about airport Wi-Fi. Most airports now offer it, but hackers know that. They'll sit at the airport and just create access points for you to join and all sorts of stuff. If you want to find out what a hacker can do with VPN, I mean, without VPN, with a with an open access, wireless access point, um, take a look at something called the Pineapple, the hardware Pineapple, which is the opposite of the tiny hardware firewall. It's a similar small device that lets a bad guy snoop on your Wi-Fi. <laughs> and, and you can see that you don't have to be a sophisticated hacker to, uh, to get in there and start messing with people. It's, uh, it's kind of risky out there. Anyway, yes, I do like it. We never did an ad for it. We have done ads for Tunnel Bear, which I which I like. They used to be a sponsor, um, but I think it is important, regardless of which you use, that you that you do protect yourself online as best you can. Tom is in Warren, Ohio. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Oh, Leo, let me shut the lawnmower off here. Just picking up some leaves. Oh, how nice! Yeah, yeah it's fall in Ohio, over here near the north coast of America. And we have to do that every fall. I've heard of that. Yes, I've heard of that. The le the leaves the leaves come off the trees. Is that what happens? They actually. Oh yes, yes. Wow. And you have a three hundred year old oak tree in your backyard. It's very many leaves, sir. My goodness, picked up. They sh yeah. that shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. That seems like a public health menace. Oh yes, it is. It's, fun. <laughs> it's wonderful fun in, in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> Great. What can I do for you, Tom? Here today. Yeah, I was uh, inquiring about those Pico-type projectors. Do you have any recommendations on any of those? I haven't used them. The idea is pretty cool. These Pico means super small. Some of them yeah. even attach to a smartphone and uh, allow you, to, instead of you know carrying around a laptop to do a PowerPoint presentation, project it from the smartphone. A couple of years ago, everybody thought that's the next big thing in smartphones, and then they died out, which tells me... There may be some problem. I think they're usually, the ones I've seen are usually lower resolution and not so bright. 
On the other hand, the idea of putting a, a PowerPoint projector in your pocket or maybe a movie projector in your pocket is pretty cool. I haven't used them. So, Tom, keep listening. Keep keep raking the leaves. And uh, anybody who is listening has an opinion, would like to make a recommendation, 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's, let's talk. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're up. Hi, Kyo, sir. Hi, Kyo. Hi, Kyo. God bless you. So, Leo, I'm really considering a Google phone now. Those pixels, did you hear that? Amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, the one, yeah, last hour, the guy, I think it was last hour, the guy who has the, who wanted the five. The, yeah. yeah, but I, but yeah, I the pixels it. are the ones, but they're very expensive, unfortunately. But the Project Fi sounds cool. Fi is Fi great. great. And yeah, get a 5X. Five they're selling, selling Google, Google sells both the 6P and the 5X for a reduced price now because they have the new pixels out. And I do love Phi. And in L.A., Phi is great. Cool. Yeah. That might be, that might be it, because I'm up in a couple of weeks. <laughs> you save a lot of money. So uh, Jammer2001 in our chat room says uh, one of our one of his classmates brought a Pico projector to school. It was really good. went up to 90 inches. <laughs> okay, so it has to be pretty close to the wall. 90 inches is not, uh, eh, that's decent. Uh, what was the brand name, Jammer Two Thousand One? Do you know? Do you remember? Uh, I don't. I just don't have any experience with Pico projectors. Uh, I noticed they haven't taken off. I don't know. Is it because it's expensive? Is it? Um, is it because they don't work great? Uh, that would be my guess. But who knows? Your thoughts always welcome. Shar is on the line from. Cambridge, Minnesota. Hi, Char. Hey. Welcome. You're one of my favorite guys. Well, oh golly. God. Thank you. <laughs> Cambridge, Minnesota. We're about in the middle of the place. We're just north of Minneapolis. Nice. I'm an old guy. Yeah. I've been fixing TV since 19, shall I say, 56? Whatever. So, yeah. That was when I was born. So you've been doing this a long time. But is there still a business fixing TVs? No, not at all. But my grandfather was really happy when I did. <laughs> so, all the time. It, so, it, see, the old tube TVs, there was lots you could do, right? Yeah, they had, they had all the schematics on the back end. So if the horizontal went out, you just replaced the tube. Yeah. That you'd find, find at the local drugstore at the time. <laughs> and they even, I remember, I remember, when, I am old enough to remember when the drugstore had tube testers. That's right. Yeah, you'd bring in a tube to see if it still was it to see if it still worked. Yeah, and you go to the shoe store and they could see your feet. You know. Yeah, they put used X-rays on your feet. That was smart. <laughs> that got a very wonderful. I used to work at a Comp USA. May it bless hearts. Oh yeah. I bought a um, off eBay. I bought a an it's a sixty gig iPod. Color now defunct. Apparently, they don't use it anymore. Yeah, I cannot access the hard drive on it. I've got pictures. I've got music that I'd love to to reach. I don't know how to do it. Yeah, this is really Apple. Dis if, so, if you think about the music industry at the time when Apple came out with the iPod in the early two thousands, uh, they saw this as the ultimate piracy device. It terrified them. Because here you have a large hard drive full of music, and what's to stop you from bringing it to a friend and saying, hey, dude, here's all my music, take it. And in fact, that's what a lot of people did. So Apple, on the other hand, Apple wanted to make it convenient and easy to use. So what Apple decided to do was to kind of um, make it a little harder to do what you're talking about. Because if you could, if I could just plug in an iPod to the computer and copy everything off of it, well, I'd be in trouble. So even if you could see it, what you'd notice is the file names are also changed. They're all hashes. They're not real file names. Again, kind of a poor man's pi anti-piracy technique. Fortunately, easy to get around. Are you on a Mac or a Windows machine? Windows 10. All right. So, um, I... By the way, uh, just so we're not misunderstanding, 
I put this on on a laptop, uh, IBM ThinkPad 40 or uh, 41, yeah, and it was running XP. Yeah. I have tried it again with that same operating system. There must be something different about the way the um, access it. It will not access it with with uh, what is it? File File Explorer or whatever it is. No, no. You, yeah, it's what I'm telling you is this is Apple's kind of cheesy way of preventing piracy. But it's a it's just a speed bump, not a roadblock. You need software. So if you're on a, a Macintosh, I recommend a program called Sanuti, which is iTunes backwards. You run this but program. I don't have a no, I know. I'm, I'm going to tell you Windows. You, but th their Windows programs do the same thing. You plug in your iPod, you run this program, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, you can see all the files on there. Plus, they're properly named. They're not hashed names. And that's what you need. So there are a number of programs that will do this on PCs as well. I don't, I don't know what the best one is. Um, maybe the chat room can tell us. Um, they're hit, you know, I mean, if you set File Explorer to show hidden files, you'll see the files, but that's still not enough because uh, the file names are hashed. So you don't want to, you want a program that will actually do a little more processing, take the index, the iTunes index, because the data is there, it's just stored in an XML file, and match it to the file, and then rename the file as it transfers over, you see. But I'm far enough along to understand that, Alil. The, the point is that the file... Explorer will not even recognize the drive when it's plugged in. Ah, so you're saying now the drive is dead or something. No, the drive works quite fine. So you're able to listen to music on the iPod, you just don't see it on File Explorer. Yeah, File Explorer doesn't even recognize the fact that there's a, there's a drive out there. Although, I did put them on there with my laptop uh, within the last uh, maybe five years. Yeah. So uh, so the iPod continues to work. You can listen to music on the iPod. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And uh, when you plug it in, it's via USB using a 30-pin cable. Now, of course, the first thing to suspect is the cable. That's just the easiest thing to check. If you have a second 30-pin connector, you might try that just to make sure it's not a bad cable. I've tried three or four of them. Okay. And then you've looked in the device manager to see if that device is visible at all. That's not... Uh, that. No. Try that. Because what we'd like to know is if you if you can see the device at all. Cannot see it. Yeah. Well, the device manager is a little bit better than File Explorer at that. Because, for instance, File Explorer may say, if this was formatted on a Mac, well, I don't know. There's nothing there because it's not any file format I recognize. But device manager will at least see that there is an attached USB drive. It'll just say, it's a different format from what I'm used to. But at least you'll know that you're actually seeing the drive. I can give that a try. When you uh, when you connect when you copied the files over, you did it on a Windows PC. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's probably uh, not it, but um, it's worth a try at least to see if the device manager shows a device. What we're trying to figure out is what's wrong here. Is it the USB connection? Probably is. Is it the iPod? Maybe it died. You're not going to get a fix for it. Obviously, uh, Apple's not going to. Well, they might, but they would charge you probably a ridiculous amount to fix it. So all I want to do, all I want to do, if you said there's software that can do it, well, there is, but it's not going to. You're right, and I apologize. It's not going to see th a drive that can't be seen by the computer in general. Sure. So that's why I want you to open up Device Manager and see if it's a, a non-present. It may be since you saw it before. It may be it's a hidden device, so that can happen too on Windows. So uh, is, is there something in Windows 10? I tried it in XP. I couldn't do it. I tried it in Windows 7. Couldn't do it. No. It was done with XP, that's for sure. Yeah, that's fine. It should still show up. Um, you could try plugging in a different computer. Um, but I, I, what I would say is... I have six. And it doesn't show up in any of them. No. Yeah, that, that sounds like now you there's something wrong with the iPod. These things break. But, uh, but uh, again, go into the device disk manager just to see, look in the device managers to see if it's a non-present device. And if it is, that, that, that'll that give you a hint that there's something going on. But I have a feeling it's broken. And they break. They break. They do. They wear out. And they're obsolete, sad to say. I have a nice 160-gig iPod. Can't really use it with anything. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. So there's a DOS command, Mike B's telling us. Set device manager, show non-present devices. That might that might help. But that that does that mean devices that are not plugged in, Mike B? I don't know if that's what we want. Um so your Linux pen drives don't show up in Explorer, Keith, as you know, because they're formatted with a file system that the Windows machine doesn't know. They show up in the disk manager, but the disk manager says there's a device. I can't read it because I don't know what the file system is. It might even show the file system ID. Using an older version of iTunes, maybe? Okay. Well, yeah, and then if you had iTunes, I certainly would try iTunes to see. But if it, it's, what, what Mike's suggesting would show a disabled device. So I doubt it's disabled, especially since he plugged into six different computers, right? Um, that sounds to me like, frankly, the iPod's broken. Because the chances that all six computers, you know, would have a disabled that iPod seems unlikely. Uh, so, you know, maybe the connector's gone bad, the 30-pin connector. He did try other cables. He says he's tried a bunch of other cables. Um, multiple computers and multiple cables sounds like a hardware issue on the iPod. That's what I would guess. So, um, Pod Trans is a is a Windows f program that can open an iPod <clears throat> and transfer the files off. Pod Trans, but but if he can't see the hardware, it's not going to help. Yeah, I think 30-pin connectors were not super robust. Just looking at the chat room, seeing what they're suggesting. I, I, th I think, frankly, uh, you, sure, you got a, you probably got a broken iPod, because you did the right thing, sure, uh, which is to plug it into a bunch of different computers with a bunch of different cables, and it's still doing all of that. Yeah, it's a broken iPod. Sorry. Sigh. Is that the only source of that music? No, it's not the, the music. It's the pictures that I want. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pictures, yeah. This is the last color one they came up with. Yeah. And um, it ran. I, it's been sitting in the closet pretty, pretty much unused for... Mm, I moved three years ago, so that would tell you about how long it's been sitting. Yeah, maybe the drive froze up. Those were actually physically spinning drives, believe it or not. No, that's that little what uh, IBM drive. Yeah, is it? exactly. Yeah. So I mean, sitting sitting could have actually been enough to destroy to make it unusable. It could be could be stiction. You know, you you know, you remember stiction? You ever deal with that? You can actually hit it with a screwdriver. <laughs> what, what happens? The head uh, uh, gets stuck to the platter. It's not supposed to touch the platter at all, but over time, it can get stuck to the platter, and so you wrap it with a screwdriver, and it unsticks it. Sometimes that fixes it. I'll give it a try. Is it get is do you, is it is it charging through the USB cable? Or are you at least able to charge? Yeah, it charges. Yeah, so it's a it's it, it could be the thirty pin connector as well because um, it, it sounds okay. So you're getting power to it. You just so it's hard to say what's wrong, but I would almost certainly it's a hardware issue. Either the connector. You got to get back to work. Yeah. Hey, it's nice to talk to you, Shar. Thank you. Take care. So, well, I didn't help much, but at least we tried every option. Yes, put it in this freezer for a week. I would bet you almost certainly it's the 30-pin connector. That thing was just... Think about it. Horrible. It's not software. It's definitely hardware. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. Debbie Burbank, Leo Laporte. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Leo. I'm sorry I hung up on you by mistake. I got so nervous when you picked up the phone. <laughs> that's I hung what it, up on you. That's exactly what it sounded like. It was like, <laughs> ah, <what> click. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you got back in. Thank you, Debbie. I am, too. Yay. So, anyhow, the reason I'm calling is, um, and by the way, I love your show. Thank you. It helped me a real lot in a lot of things. So. Right. Um, the reason I'm calling is I have an old, old HP PhotoSmart 2610. Yeah. And it's still kind of working, but it's time to get a new one so that I can um, print from my iPad and my Galaxy 3. So you do and, print you print wirelessly then? Well, I don't. That one, I can't. Oh. So, 
I want to be able to. And I was looking at, um, I have a, when I bought my HP laptop, it came with a PhotoSmart D110A, but it doesn't fax. So I never. Oh, you want an all in one? Well, it came with, when my um, husband got me the, for Christmas, like three years ago, um, he bought me an HP laptop. Ah. And it came with a PhotoSmart D110A, but. I never used it because it didn't have fax. So the so the the nowadays almost all printers are wireless, which means you don't have to connect them via USB. You just put them. You have Wi-Fi at home, right? Right. You right. put them on the Wi-Fi network. Right. So those you can print to with tablets. Um, Google has a system called Google Print on Android devices. Uh, for Apple devices, they have their own Air Print, but most printers are compatible. But do look for Google Cloud Print and Air Print compatibility. Then, if you, it sounds like you want an all-in-one because you want to send faxes, right? Yeah, and yeah. I was looking at Costco. But I don't know which one to go with. I've had such good luck with HP. HP's fine and uh, not my favorite, but they're fine. Uh, there are quite a few companies. I like Canon and Epson for photo printing. Photo printing is a little different from standard printing. And is that the number one thing you want to do with this is print photos? Well, because I haven't been able to print photos, yeah, I would love to yeah. start printing photos. Yeah. Uh, but you do other printing as well or just photo printing? Um, photo, pr well... And I do a lot of faxing. Yeah. Um, and occasionally printing, not very much. But okay. So a good photo, a good all-in-one photo printer would be a, a a good choice for you. I would. F so the faxes. Are you faxing paper documents that you have yeah, well, physical like descriptions? Yeah. I have a chronic pain disease, so right. I have to fax a lot of things to my pharmacy and Got it. And they will only accept a fax. They won't accept an email, for instance. Well, I wouldn't know how to... Well, I'm just... Uh, you know, nowadays, faxing is kind of dying out. So, uh, for instance, most people would take a picture with their camera phone of the prescription and oh, then... Oh, yeah, that's right. I could take it with my iPad and then just... And then email, email it. it, yeah. As long as the pharmacist will accept that, that's a much simpler process. I, the reason is if we could eliminate the faxing, you'd have a much broader range of choices. Okay. All-in-ones generally aren't great photo printers. A photo printer is really meant for printing photos, and it uses glossy or matte paper, good photo paper, and it, it gives you really rich, vibrant color, and all of that typically will be a dedicated printer designed for photos like, well, if it's expensive, but the Epson uh, Sure Color, which is uh, the pick from wirecutter.com, um, that's a little pricey, but uh, they also say if you're on a budget, the Canon Pixma, which I've always liked, the Pixma Pro 100, or the Pixma Pro 10, those are both very good as well. Epson or Canon make the best photo printers. Almost all the photographers, oh, and I should say, disclaimer, Epson is a sponsor of this show. Okay. Just, but, but, I, but I'm but i going to give you my objective belief as opposed to the ad, okay? Okay. <laughs> so almost all the photographers I know use Epson's. Particularly because okay. Epson does really good black and white. And I, you probably don't care about that. Well, I used to, you know, I went to photography school, so oh. I do, do a lot of black and white. Well, there's an issue with printing black and white called metamerism that uh, Epson's the only one that really has licked. So if you ever are going to do monochrome prints, Epson's photo printers are what the pros use. And they have yeah. large format and small. They can do 5 by 7s But if you want, you can get an Epson that'll do 19 by 14 And, man, the color is gorgeous the black and white is gorgeous that's what i use uh but i also have used canon's pixmas they're excellent hp i'm sure has a photo printer that's fine i i just i'm not familiar with it i'll tell you the strike against hp the thing that bugs me about hp they just did this last month they updated the firmware on their inkjet printers so that they wouldn't use anybody's cartridges but hp's they literally reject any cartridge that doesn't have a chip in it that says this is an HP cartridge. And I find that anti-consumer. Um, Canon does not do that. Epson does not do that. So um, did they... Now, somebody's saying they've changed that. I don't know if they have. But that bothered me that HP did that. I, I'm not sure. They Okay, so they got enough kickback from the, uh, the users. They changed their mind. And they reverted that. Well, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that when you okay. went on, on um, Costco, they automatically asked you about, yeah. picked a printer, and they automatically asked you about the cartridges. Right, yeah. Well, in general, you do have to use the 
cartridges made by the company usually get a better result. So uh, I'm just going to quote the wire cutter. I love this site. It's a great review site. They're objective. Uh, they said the best photo inkjet printer is the pricey, almost $800 Epson Sure Color. But that's yeah, for, I can't. I'm yeah, yeah, that's bargain. ridiculously expensive. That's for pros. That's really yeah. that's for pros. But but a, a well, a, you know, a bargain they're going to get you on the ink, right? They're going to you going to get a $90 photo printer where it costs you more to print than uh, you know, costs you 10 bucks a print. You don't want that either. So you always have to know. think about how much the ink is going to cost. Um, I was thinking around the 2 or 300 dollar range. Yeah, I think the look at a Canon Pixma. Okay. I think they make, and Epson does make less expensive photo printers. Um, and then eliminate the faxing. So either send pictures, email. If you, there are services that you can send faxes uh, via, you know, like an email, you send it on the web. Um, I, uh, I, I just think if you can eliminate faxing, you'll have a larger choice of great printer somebody in the chat room saying uh i use a canon mp940 does a good job with photos if you want if you're a photographer and you are right you study photographer yep. you want yep. great prints a really good photo printer is a little more expensive a little more expensive but again the inks are more expensive and the paper you're not going to use plain paper you're going to use good paper right right all of that adds up but i for for my money for the last 20 years if i do photo printing i use epson so, but you can you can get the the lesser expensive you know the best Epson you can afford. How about that? Okay. Yeah, and nowadays if you don't print a lot, it might even be better to use a service because uh, you can get prints pretty good quality prints for twenty, thirty, forty cents a print, um, and without all the hassle of printing for yourself. But get an you know what they're a sponsor. I'm going to say it anyway because I like them. Get an Epson. Yeah, I was looking at there was one at Costco for like two sixty nine. Yeah. The, the new one that's got the ink already in. Oh, it. the eco tanks. Yeah, yeah, those are really great, and that saves you money on the ink. So you know what? If you can get it at that price, go for it. Okay. Go for it. The Epson Artisans are the ones I think of as the photo printers. Those are the why, but they're all wireless now. They'll all work with your tablets, which is great. You know, Lightroom on <laughs> on iPad. Who would have thunk it? Is really a great solution. You can actually do on an iPad. And because it's touch, you can sit in your couch, you can sit in your chair, you can pick the photos you like, print them. It's awesome. Thanks to Kim Schaffer for answering the phones uh, today and our new musical director. We love him, Mike Cozio. Thanks to all of you for joining us. If you uh, can come back next week, I would appreciate it. We'd love to talk tech with you. Just remember the website's available all week long, techguylabs.com, techguylabs.com. I'm Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy. Thanks for joining me, and have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts. For this show, we talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.